Do not attempt to think or depression may occur. Stay, stay in your homes. Curfew is at 7 p.m. sharp after work. Anyone caught outside the gates of their subdivisions after curfew will be shot. Remain calm. Do not panic. Your neighborhood watch officer will be by to collect urine samples in the morning. Anyone interfering with the collection of urine samples will be shot. Houses will be inspected for trace elements at noon. Anyone failing to display the mandatory embossed black velvet Mexican style painting of King George Bush II on their living room wall will be shot. To further protect private property from terrorist attacks, cameras and surveillance equipment will be placed on all lamp posts and street lights. Anyone failing to attend morning school prayer and prescribed worship services on Sunday will be promptly arrested and dispatched to a re-education resort. Stay in your homes. Remain calm. The number one enemy of progress is questions. <laughs> National security is more important than individual rights. Under the provisions of the War on Drugs, the War on Terrorism, and the Child Protection and Obscenity Enforcement Act, all property and life savings of suspected drug users and suspected pornographers will be seized and sold prior to trial. Anyone opposing this policy will be presumed to be under the influence of drugs and shipped immediately to boot camp to serve a sentence of hard labor beneath an inflatable statue of Nancy Reagan <laughs> being humped by Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> Sports broadcasts will proceed as scheduled. No more than two people may gather anywhere without permission. Use only the drugs prescribed by your coach, your boss, or your supervisor. Shut up. Be happy. Obey all orders without question. Shut up. The comfort you've demanded is now mandatory. At last, everything is done for you. Boy, that must be awesome to be able to watch the back of my head. That's just, uh... What was that? Oh, okay, I'll be like Mark Smith in the fall. Or the bass player of the Melvins when he's got his pedals on and stuff. There you go. Oh, well, unfortunately, if I turn my head this way too much, I would run into this image just a little too often and it's very painful for me to have to go into this at all because I still am in utter disbelief. I'll be back. That was, oh yeah, well, I'll be back. Hasta la vista democracy. To put it mildly, what a scam! What a coup! I mean, I kept thinking people can't be that dumb. They can't be that dumb. Especially, this was the only piece of campaign literature I found from him. And, uh, are we still on? Yeah, we are. Okay. Anyway, um, and all it says, I want to be the people's governor. <laughs> I will work without fear to do what is right for the people of California. 
And then, here's his entire platform. Let's bring California back. What does that mean? Oh, he wants to, oh, let's see. Uh, oh, our people have been doing their part, working hard. But today, dreams and optimism and opportunity are eluding too many Californias. Our state is in trouble, especially now. <laughs> and here we go. And I'm running for governor to end business as usual in California. Ho, 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 ho. First he says, oh, fiscally conservative government with Republican principles. Republican and principles have been an oxymoron for a long, long, long time. Hey, well, when did you not stand for it then? What's that? You should have stood for it. Oh, I didn't, I didn't want to interfere with it. Huh? I don't want to take, uh, take votes from Gary Coleman. <laughs> Flint. Or more to the point, what about uh, the one I endorsed was Peter Camejo of the Green Party, who I thought was a really, really good candidate, and I didn't want to drain votes for him, so thus I missed an opportunity to add that much more uh, toxic fuel to the fire. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> ending business as usual. Well, one of the reasons they pulled this little scam, where there were two of them, as you probably know, there wasn't even supposed to be an election this fall for governor. We had it last year, and then a car alarm tycoon named Daryl Issa, who's like an extreme right-wing congressman, decided to try and get a recall off the ground because the governor, the sitting governor before, who admittedly was not a very sympathetic guy, Gray Davis, he raised taxes on cars. Ooh. This will cost you your head. But nobody seemed to be interested in it until he threw a million and a half dollars behind the petition drive and paid people to gather signatures and all. And then all of a sudden, there it was. And on the very last possible day, Arnold announces on a chat show, Jay Leno, that he's running, and then he was on other chat shows, Oprah Winfrey, Larry King, Howard Stern, and none of the other candidates were allowed to appear. And all of a sudden, it was just all Arnold, all the time, on the media. What a great way to get people to forget that Bush made such a huge, huge mistake in Iraq, and that Arnold is fronting for Bush, which he basically was and is. The reason they wanted him in there so bad is because that way, 2004 could be another close election and the Bush people aren't about to uh, let anything possibly go wrong like some candidate getting more votes than him like in the last election. <laughs> I mean, as a political comedian named Bill Maher put it, the Republicans will do anything to win an election except get the most votes. <laughs> And this, unfortunately, is another example of that. Hey, hello, do you want a pint? Put it in a bar. Good for you. Do you want a pint of Lego? Sorry, mate. Imagine being his parents. <laughs> Somebody told me there's vegetarian haggis now. <laughs> How is it? It's good. Manky. <laughs> Manky, I haven't heard that yet. <laughs> I know what it means, but I haven't heard it in a long time. Anyway, Arnold. They wanted Arnold in there so because they know the 2004 election, they're going to be watching Florida really, really carefully. Just, but, but, so you need to cheat in another state instead. And who's going to challenge the Terminator if they're not allowed to vote because they are black or something? That was one part of the scam. The other part of the scam and part of what uh, led to a lot of disillusionment with uh, Gray Davis, the other governor, 
was there was this horrible energy crisis in California, not so coincidentally right after Bush took office. Suddenly electricity bills doubled, tripled, quadrupled, and the wholesale price sold to the energy delivery people went, in some cases, from $30 per kilowatt hour to $30,000 per kilowatt hour. Why? Because the Democrats, as well as the Republicans, got the bright idea that privatizing the power supply wasn't going far enough. You had to completely deregulate the rules and get rid of all the restrictions on what those companies could do. And so immediately they began gouging everybody, nobody more so than the Enron Corporation, who also helped build George Bush. Here he says he's getting one and he comes back with three. <laughs> anyway, um, oh, now I'm spacing where I was. I forgot to, oh, uh, come on, come on, come on. Enron. Not... Enron, yes, thank you. And Enron were the ones who were cutting off the electricity and cutting off the natural gas to see how far they could drive up the price. One of many, Ross Perot was another one who was up to no good on that one. And it turned out that uh, before they even pulled this drive up the electricity scam, Arnold had been meeting with the head of Enron, who may well be on his way to jail now, Kenneth Lay, as well as some other big wigs in the Republican Party, both state and uh, national, and then apparently met again with them right after they manipulated and got the electricity crisis going, and it turned out that the, current, the sitting governor Davis and his lieutenant governor Cruz Bustamante had uh, filed a $9 billion lawsuit against Enron for ripping everybody off, which is about to go to trial. Except now there's a new governor who can order that the entire lawsuit be dropped. And that's, you know, that's a great way to save nine billion bucks is to do something like this. You know, he was on TV all the time, and then they, they were saying, oh, well, he's been grabbing women's titties on movie sets for 20 years. And, oh, no, no, that's not a problem. It is for anybody else. But with Arnold, I mean, they ran quotes with women in the media saying, well, those women are probably just jealous because he didn't do more with them, or other women are just mad because he didn't grab theirs. You know, so much for uh, equal rights on that one at all. And uh, basically all he had in here was, Taxes bad. Too many restrictions on business. Maybe, oh, what's, oh, demand safe and clean schools. Yeah, well, when you don't collect any taxes, you can't pay for the schools. Can you, Arnold? And, uh, oh yes, English is the official language of the United States. <laughs> and the only reason they have that in there is it's well, this way of saying this, to Latinos who speak Spanish and all. That's, that's a, it's a racist thing, basically. And so then Arnold, when he was on all these chat shows and all, meanwhile, he refused to debate any of the other candidates or be seen in public too often or anything. It was all gonna be done on TV. Finally, he agreed to debate the candidates on the last of the televised debates only if the questions were scripted and given to him in advance. And now, what they're saying is, oh, Arnold Mania in U.S., everybody's so happy that the Terminator is terminating democracy and becoming governor. And now they're even trying to change the Constitution so that he can become president, too. It's all a matter of triumph of the will, I guess. I don't know. But uh, I'm sure I'll think of some other things on that, but I'm still, I'm still in shock from that. Oh, thank you. I don't usually drink much of this anymore, but uh, well, why not? Usually I like mine a little bit darker color. But anyway, in exchange, let me do my thing tonight, okay? <laughs> But you do, you do need to uh, <laughs> and answer.
answer a very important question. Has anybody out there seen an old American Western cowboy movie from the 1930s called The Terror of Tiny Town? Well, it says right at the beginning when you roll the film, a rollicking, rootin' tootin' shootin' drama of the great outdoors. And I'm not much for Westerns or cowboy movies, but this one is special because the cast is all midgets. <laughs> All midget western, and the guy called the the guy called the hero. That's his only name in the credits, played by Billy Curtis, and another one called the villain in the credits, played by Little Billy, who's bigger than Billy Curtis, and storms onto the set right as it opens. I'm the baddest old brand in all of Tiny Town. <laughs> Outside of Tiny Town, I guess there's two competing ranchers who own most of the land, and Black Hat Villain strolls into the saloon and just comes right out and announces to the sheriff, I'm grabbing myself a nice bunch of cattle from both sides, and each, si each side blames the other. I'll finally end up owning both outfits. And the sheriff pleaded, it's my duty to keep the peace. Kind of like the United Nations. <laughs> and uh, then, to which the villain said, it's your duty to do as I tell you. Kind of like somebody else we know. <laughs> and then he cozied up to the bar room, floozy saloon girl at the bar and says, uh, I'll keep my promise and load you down with diamonds. And she's listed in the credits as the vampire. <laughs> Quickly, White Hat is framed for killing one of the ranchers, Tex Preston, and then the Black Hat gets more and more carried away, too big for his britches, goes back into the bar and clocks the saloon girl, leaves her on the floor. Sheriff finally stands up to him and he shoots the sheriff dead in cold blood, and for that he has to hightail it out of town. And the hero in the white hat corners him in a cabin in Big Rock Canyon. And the knockdown drag out fight begins. But the vampire has followed them there and rolls a cluster of dynamite sticks into the cabin. <laughs> the fuse burns. The hero, of course, escapes into the arms of the good girl just in the nick of time while the villain is blown to smithereens and everyone lives happily ever after. The moral of the story being, why Iraq? <laughs> Sir, nobody has been more cold-blooded and cynical and exploiting the tragedy of September 11, 2001 and pissing on the graves of the innocent victims than Bush and his cowboys themselves. Bush said we have to launch a preemptive war. We have to attack them because they might attack us someday. Isn't that how Hitler justified invading Poland? Yes! And Austria and France and so many other countries. But Iraq is violating UN resolutions. Well, a preemptive war violates the UN Charter, written mostly by the United States in 1945 to prevent any more preemptive wars. And who violates more Security Council resolutions than anybody else? Bush! Israel. <laughs> and number two is Turkey. No, but we have to have a preemptive war because, well, Saddam Hussein, well, I know for a fact that Saddam Hussein might have weapons of mass destruction. <laughs> and what do you know? We still can't find them. And now they're saying, oh yeah, well we never actually expected to find them. They're so well hidden they won't turn up for years. Then they said, but, but, but Saddam said he had them. <laughs> and we believed him. And oh, what other ones are they saying? Oh yeah, well they're saying that Iraqis who they, we've kidnapped and put lie detectors on them, find out where the weapons are, and they all say they're gone. 
and they pass the lie detector test. Well, Saddam has a secret method to get around lie detector tests. And Colin Powell said that he knew for a fact that Saddam Hussein had between 100 and 500 tons of weapons of mass destruction. And so far, all we've been able to find is one tiny little vial of botulism toxin <laughs> that they took out of a scientist's apartment. He may well have stolen it. Who knows? Even before the war, Bush and his cowboys were just scrambling for excuses to go ahead with this scam they'd been planning even before Bush was president. What do we do to justify this war? Well, Bush's chief of staff, Andrew Card, said in September 2002, right before the midterm United States elections, when we, they were first thumping and thumping for war, well, why now? He's asked, well, from a marketing point of view, this is a real quote, from a marketing point of view, you don't introduce new products in August. <laughs> he actually said that. So then they had to market some more. Oh, well, well, well Saddam Hussein caused September 11th and he's in bed with Al-Qaeda. No. But, but, but we saw an Al-Qaeda operative in Baghdad a couple months before <laughs> September 11th. There were a lot more Al-Qaeda operatives in the United States before <laughs> September 11th. Oh, but Saddam Hussein is six months away from building a nuclear bomb. International Atomic Energy Agency again says no. So then the excuses got really good. Saddam Hussein is building a fleet of unmanned aircraft, you know, remote control drone planes that could be used for missions targeting the United States. Picture this. A remote control plane takes off, gets all the way across Iraq, all the way across Turkey, all the way across Europe, maybe this island as well, all the way across the Atlantic Ocean, and nobody spots it before it blows up the Capitol building or the White House? Well, they did find one remote control plane, finally. It had a range of a few miles. It was powered by a propeller. The fuselage was made out of balsa wood, and it was all held together with duct tape. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, that's a weapon of mass destruction if I've ever heard of one. So then we said, well, Saddam Hussein, he's this is where all the weapons of mass destruction are hiding. They're all in semi-trucks mobile weapons labs that drive up and down what's left of the blown up pockmarked highways of Iraq just to evade all our spy satellites. I haven't heard of that as a way of hiding a nuke lab since Get Smart, a 1960s American secret agent comedy and all. And the picture of the, uh, you know, it's probably a petrol truck if they were doing this in Iraq so it's all curved and scientists are hunched over in there huffing all the fumes and everything, <laughs> trying to make anthrax bombs or trying to make new toys and stuff as the truck rumbles along, boink, boink, boink. Doesn't work for me. Then my favorite of all their excuses, we go blow up Iraq and kill a bunch of people and kill Saddam Hussein. Peace will break out all over the Middle East like magic. The Saudi royal family and Mubarak and Egypt and the rest will be inspired to immediately hold elections. And the Israelis and the Palestinians will go arm in arm to the dance together. Well, that didn't seem to fly either. So then they send Colin Powell to walk the plank and go to the United Nations and say with a straight face that there's one 500 tons or whatever it was of nuclear weapons and, you know, do his best step and fetch an imitation to say, no, no, I have special new secret evidence, the smoking gun, photographic proof, and I got it from Tony Blair. <laughs> Would he lie to you? <laughs> and then Blair, of course, I don't know the exact quote, but it's apparently the one people are all riled up about over here was he had the gall to say something like, Saddam Hussein would strike us with a nuclear weapon in 45 minutes. <laughs>
So the moral of the story is, if you look up in the sky and see a balsa wood plane moving slowly <laughs> towards you with a nuclear bomb duct taped on top, you have 45 minutes to cover yourself with butter or grease or lard, then some cornflake crumbs or whatever, head on down to Kentucky Fried Chicken or the latest, the nearest haggis shop. I'm ready, fry me! <laughs> But unfortunately, the nuclear argument proved very powerful. Many people who sometimes vote conscientiously in Congress, who should have known better, went right along with it after that. And even my father, who's very anti-war and very anti-Bush, said, well, I thought if he really did have uh, nuclear weapons, maybe we did have to do something. But now they're all asking, well, just like over here, were we lied to? Well, yeah. <laughs> Bush, at his uh, State of the Union speech last January, where the president comes out every year around the end of January and uh, has to talk to both houses of Congress, and they carry it live on a lot of the TV networks, laying out his agenda for the year. And Bush said, well, Saddam Hussein, you know, this, this, this weird little frightened chimp look he gets sometimes, <laughs> trying to look concerned. Saddam Hussein is trying to obtain nuclear weapons in Africa. <laughs> well, 11 months earlier, his specially chosen CIA investigator, Joseph Wilson, who used to be the ambassador to Iraq, told him that that story wasn't true. Reported back after going down to the African country of Niger to see if Saddam was really trying to get a hold of what they call yellow cake uranium to try and make a nuclear bomb. And apparently he followed the yellow cake road and uh, <laughs> other news sources have said that uh, it, this whole report of yellow cake originated with Italian intelligence who turned out to have bought the document from Nigerian con men and stuff. <laughs> but then, of course, it reached the paws of bigger con men. And in March of this year, International Atomic Energy Agency again told the United Nations Security Council this story is not true. And Bush and Blair promptly invaded Iraq anyway. <laughs> in spite of the largest demonstrations in the history of the world against them. 15 million people, probably some from here, all hitting the streets to say this to Bush and Blair. And bravo to the leaders of Germany and France and the other countries who were expected to go along but have still refused, even after the new United Nations resolution, to send any troops or even any money to bail Bush and his little poodle out of this, uh, out of this jam. And I think, even though the demonstrations didn't stop the war, I think they went a long way in making sure Schroeder and Germany and Chirac, who I never thought I'd have a single good thing to say about, I mean, his nickname in France is Super Crook. It was the demonstrations that put the heat on them not to get brown lipstick on their face from getting too close to Bush and Blair and all. And it also may have prevented a much worse bombing campaign that Bush and Rumsfeld originally had in mind. When they said they were going to use shock and awe on Iraq, they meant turning Baghdad into Dresden and the rest of the Iraq over and over and over again. However, I think the way it played out in the American media was, oh, look, our good friends, the English, they're totally down with us, too. That must make it okay. And now they call the invading force the coalition and all. So people think everybody's down with us. And I think without Blair as a fig leaf for Bush, Bush wouldn't have been able to go in. That was Blair's role in the whole thing, but why? I mean, I'm not real familiar with the Hutton Inquiry or uh, what happened to David Kelly, which uh, 
I heard a, they ran that for about a day on the American news, and then it was gone forever. You know, once the body wasn't there to show anymore, it didn't bleed, so it didn't bleed. But it seems like uh, Blair is getting a hell of a lot more shit than Bush is over this, possibly because you still have some semblance of a free press over here and more views allowed in the news than what we get where I'm come from. To Plus, point, uh, to, a point. to a point, yeah, but wait till you see what, uh, what passes for news where I come from. I mean, it's just, uh, I, I mean, I mean the stuff like The Guardian and some of the more investigative sides of the BBC ain't perfect, but it's better than nothing by a long shot. Better than nothing but this, over and over and over again, passing for all the news you need to know. Plus, unfortunately, in America, there is no such thing as question time, which is really too bad. Imagine Bush at question time, or Reagan, or his father, for that matter. And since we were basically a one-party state masquerading as a two-party state, we might as well call them the corporate party or the republicrats. The whole concept of having a shadow cabinet that dogs the real one and offers alternatives is just completely unheard of. And remember when uh, Blair said that he was going to be the leash on Bush, and that was why he had to go in, because he could keep Bush from going too far. That didn't happen, did it? He could have used the special friendship with the U.S. to try and keep the thing under the umbrella and authority of the United Nations, but chose not to. Why? Hopefully he'll come up with a good answer for that at so some point. Why? Why? Well, I mean, that, that kind of is a given, isn't it? <laughs> but, uh... Oh dear, his heart is getting weird. <laughs> Maybe the shock of that being, oh my god, he has one. <laughs> Meanwhile, back, back at the UN, think of the Powell at the UN also said that what he had was photographic proof. And his photographic proof was an aerial photo of a blurry aerial photo of what looked like a great big warehouse or something <laughs> with sand and rocks around it, which could have been an IKEA store under construction in Arizona, for all you could tell from that picture. But no! Words with arrows pointing to different parts of the building. What more do you need? Look, there's even a truck over there with another arrow to it. What does that tell you? I've had real trouble with accepting photographic proof for a while now. And it was especially brought home to me when I was out causing a little bit of trouble at the 2000 Republican Convention in Philadelphia where they were nominating Bush and took a little side trip into this big exhibit hall where they had a nice display on how the Bush crowd thinks Americans should remember their history and all lots of rah-rah, red, white, and blue stuff. Get your picture taken waving from Air Force One, the president's plane, and they had a cut-off bit of fuselage in there that looked a little too much like the part that landed after the Lockerbie explosion. It was just a little bit too close for my liking, but uh, really creepy. Well, even creepier than the coffee table books of Bush's father, photographic memories, an entire book on the dog they had in the White House at that point. But there was a photo booth you could go there and get your picture taken and then they'd put it into a computer and play around with it in Photoshop for a little bit and woo, presto, there's a photo of you hanging out with George W. Bush. And it looked totally real, which makes me wonder, if it's that easy to do that, that doctor of picture and doctor of photography that fast in Photoshop now, I didn't think to get one. No. Um, no, come on, leave me alone for a while. Let me do this. Um, yeah. Well, anyway, if it's that easy to make something like that, how many photos we see in the newspaper, the news magazines that we accept as proof, and even video footage, how much of it is not real. 
really makes me wonder after that. I mean, there's been plenty of other ugly cases of wagging the dog through uh, cooperative corporate media in order to get people to go off to war in recent times. Gulf War number one, Saddam Hussein invades Kuwait. Americans don't care. <laughs> Maybe because they have no idea where Kuwait is or what it is, have never heard of Iraq. Some of them may have heard of Persian Gulf, but get them to find it on a map, good luck. <laughs> that is the state of our school system and all. It cranks out people dumb enough to vote for Arnold Schwarzenegger if they <laughs> show up and vote at all. Anyway. So they had to do something to get people riled up, and it was splattered across the corporate news. Saddam Hussein savage butchers are storming hospitals in Kuwait, dumping premature babies out of incubators, and leaving them to die on the floor of the hospital as they run off the equipment back to Basra and Baghdad, and then they trotted out a seemingly shell-shocked young Kuwaiti woman who testified before Congress and thus the TV cameras as well. Look what they're doing to my country. Please, America, save Kuwait for democracy. <laughs> Turned out, the story was planted. <laughs> Listen to them, they're right, okay? <laughs> anyway, I can well, I don't, I'm, I'm going to talk to them, not to you, okay? <laughs> you don't want me to talk about Scotland. I'm not going to pretend I'm an expert on Scotland, but I don't live here. But anyway, um, where was I? This is the problem. Okay, they brought up the Kuwaiti woman. Well, it turned out that story was planted, and the woman hired by the Hill and Knowlton Advertising Agency, who were employed by the Kuwaiti royal family to wag the dog and persuade the American people that we needed to launch a full-scale war in the Middle East just to put them back on their throne. Democracy be damned. The woman was the daughter of the Kuwaiti ambassador to the United States, and Bush's father, King George I, even gave Hill and Knowlton a $14 million bonus of taxpayers' money to thank them for helping promote the war. Before that, we were tormented by the tale of the Libyan hit squad. The, this, oh, danger, danger, danger! Gaddafi has dispatched a Libyan hit squad to infiltrate the United States and assassinate Ronald Reagan. <laughs> to which some of us were going, go, go, go! But then we realized, oh my God, if he got bumped off, then we'd have this horrible former CIA director named Bush in the White House, and couldn't bear the thought of that. But meanwhile, in the newspaper, they had the composite drawings of the Libyan hit squad, which I wanted to use as a promotion photo for dead Kennedys, but uh, got shot down on that one. And then it didn't take long, only a few years, for it to be exposed during the Countergate scandal that the Libyan hit squad never existed. And it was made up out of thin air by a then unknown renegade military officer working in the White House basement named Oliver North. <laughs> yeah. Gulf of Tonkin incident, even worse. 1964, splattered all over the corporate news. Oh my God, North Vietnamese communist gunboats have been firing on American ships in the Gulf of Tonkin. And then President Lyndon Johnson used that to ram through the Gulf of Tonkin resolution through the usual puppy dog Republican Congress. And voila, the Vietnam War was on. What did we gain out of that? Almost 60,000 Americans dead. Many, many more scarred for life, dwarfed by the death toll of the Vietnamese, estimated at between one and two million people killed in that war. And now the corporate media just acknowledges as though it's no big deal that the Gulf of Tonkin incident basically never occurred. Now they keep us 
Now they keep us all down and go, all ready to go along with Bush and the war on terrorism scams with endless alerts. Every six weeks or two months, like clockwork, we get another Bush flunky announcing, well, we have fresh, new, important evidence that there's going to be a terrorist attack in five days. And they never happen. They were going to bomb the shopping malls on Halloween. Didn't happen. And they were going to blow up our Independence Day parades on the 4th of July. Didn't happen. So now we're on a color code system instead. Usually every day is a yellow day. Moderate terrorist danger. <laughs> but every once in a while it gets upped to, oh, orange alert, red alert, every flavor in a box of tricks or Fruit Loops alert, the terrorists are coming, the terrorists are coming, ducked and cover, America, cover, the, cover your windows and doors with gaffer's tape and it'll keep out all the nerve gas and the anthrax and the dirty bombs and everything else. And people were falling for this and buying all these extra supplies to prepare to live in their little cocoon and all that. A lot of good that would do. The gas will go right through if that ever actually happened. But it was very helpful to the uh, coffers of the Manco Corporation, who makes about half the duct tape in the United States, and are heavy contributors to the Republican Party. And before that, just to make sure people were really cowering under their beds, well, Congress was sneaking past everybody the USA Patriot Act. Heard of that one? I think some of you probably heard of that. That's the one that says we can now detain any foreigner that uh, you know we think might be a terrorist hold them in jail, often in solitary, for as long as we want to and never charge them with a crime, never bring them to trial, never let them even talk to a lawyer or anything. They're trying to extend that to citizens now, too. And most of Congress didn't even bother to read the Patriot Act before they passed it almost unanimously, just like the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. And it's too bad, because also in there it said that now the FBI could come into anybody's home, go through their stuff, go through the computer, their hard drive, whatever, put a little cookie thing on there so all your keystrokes go straight to the government too from then on, and not even tell you they've been there. But if you find them there and tell somebody else that they've been there, you can go to jail for that too. They've even been threatening people who work at libraries and at bookstores, you know, give us a list of everybody reading books we don't like. Or we're going to say, and if you tell anybody else we've been here, we're going to send you to jail too. Even if it's an attorney you tell to try and get your ass out of jail. That's how horrible the Patriot Act is. But Americans weren't concerned about the Patriot Act. It was still fresh after September 11th. They were all hiding under their beds, cowering because of 2001 and anthrax odyssey. <laughs> Never did I, I, I was still over here when that happened. And some of the, you know, the tabloids over here, was, I can't remember if it was the mail or one of the other ones, had a whole front page, I've got anthrax which I couldn't resist cutting out and taping to my shirt and wearing all over London the rest of the day. 2001 and anthrax story. Never did I think that all I would have to do for entertainment would be to go down to the grocery store, look at bags of flour, and laugh. Get to the baking soda aisle and start plotting evil things. Hey, you ex-members of Dead Kennedys have been suing the shit out of me for five years now. I'm gonna send you some powdered sugar. Yeah! Do I need, do I have to go into all that? I have no regrets about our band, our music, and our legacy, or any of that, but those three guys have made the last five years of my life the worst five years of my life, with no end in sight. Still suing me today, too. 
started in 1998 when they went running to a big badass corporate lawyer who represented such grassroots ethics punk pioneers as Journey, Boston, <laughs> Doobie Brothers, Carlos Santana, people fighting over Jerry Garcia's money, and guess where most of it's going now? Anyway, they sued me in a dispute that got ugly because I didn't want to put Holiday in Cambodia in a Levi's TV commercial. Yeah. And I appreciate the support on that, but this is what I've gotten in return, is basically non-stop legal harassment, I'm practically a million dollars in debt now, and I have never had anything close to that kind of money in my life, and probably never will. And they dragged me through a full-on jury trial, lasting almost a month, where Ray, Klaus, and D.H. Peligro each went up on the witness stand and lied, claiming they wrote all the music to the songs, and I couldn't possibly have written any of the things that I'm credited with writing because, well, he doesn't play an instrument, and worse yet, jury, he doesn't read sheet music. <laughs> They said that with a straight face. And then they said they wanted damages because Alternative Tentacles used some of the money that came in from Dead Kennedys the way most labels use extra money. You help other bands out. This was supposed to be a community thing, right? They wanted damages because we put money into the butthole surfers and No Means No and Alice Donut and Neurosis and Wesley, Wesley Willis. Yeah. And you heard Wesley earlier. Yeah, did you get Greatest Hits 3 yet? It just came out. Anyway, you know, and the newer ones like Ayahuasca and Flaming Stars from over on these shores and uh, Fleshies, Phantom Limbs, Comets on Fire, Dead Weight, Crucifix, there you go. Um, they thought all of that should be punishable in a court of law. We've been putting out spoken word stuff with uh, Noam Chomsky and Howard Zinn and Angela Davis and Greg Palast coming up too. Most of it been in conjunction with a company that began not that far from here in Sterling, wasn't it? AK Press? Or did they start? And, uh, Anyway, so, uh, and don't forget the amoebics either. That was also punishable in a court of law, apparently. But uh, granted, there was an accounting error on our part that amounted to shorting those guys by, and myself, by mistake, about $1,500 per year. And when we, not they, found the error, we paid them way back beyond the statute of limitations, paid them the whole thing, and then they sued. And they even called up an expert witness from Grateful Dead Records, of all people, who testified that I should have to be paying them half a million dollars in damages for lack of promotion. Because the people who now claim they wrote MTV Get Off the Air were not regularly on MTV for the last 15 years after the band broke up. And they wanted damages for not being in corporate music rags like Rolling Stone and Spin. And they wanted damages for not being on VH1 even. Which, uh, you know, that's an adult network where you can see an Elton John video or something. And uh, to their own visible shock, the jury fell for it. And sure enough, awarded them hundreds of thousands of dollars in damages, which they've now swiped off me from a bond I put up, that now I have to find a way to pay that off, which is gonna possibly be the end, but I don't know. Anyway, they said, well, maybe we'll reduce the damages some if you'll rejoin the band. <laughs> yeah. This is what punk is to them in this day and age. Anyway, they also got awarded all the rights to anything to do with Dead Kennedys, so I'm now not allowed any say in any of the ways the stuff is getting pimped these days. 
They pimped it over here to a distributor called Plastic Head, who now markets them under the name DK Music. They've cut up some of the artwork, they've altered the sound, and changed all the songwriter credits, and then sent me the bill for redoing the artwork. And then, uh, well, then they sent a, and then put out that live album that I begged them to take my name off of because it was so bad. And, uh, you know, well, you should have listened before you bought it, shouldn't you? All it would take would be the first song and you'd hear Ray blow his parts in police trucks six times. That's how little they cared if the thing was even any good. And so then they sent me a letter in August of 2002 saying, well, now that we've swiped everything, ha, 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 we're not going to pay you anymore. So sue us. Because we say what we owe you is all now going to go to us because that is your band member share of our legal bill to sue yourself. That's how greedy they are. And then, meanwhile, they dusted off the name of the band. They'd taken no pride in all those years. Never participated in anything after we split except cashing checks. And it's not as though they were poor. They never even bothered to get a job, for the most part. But anyway, suddenly, they're doing fake reunion shows with a former TV child star as the singer who never even learned the words. And Klaus bragged on stage in San Francisco that they'd only rehearsed twice. And then we got letters from Virginia reporting that this guy, Brandon Cruz, had come out on stage and called me a terrorist, <laughs> compared me to Osama bin Laden, and said I didn't love my country because I didn't support George Bush. Did you see him on the George Bush And then... The supposedly, according to those letters, D.H. Peligro came out and dedicated holiday in Cambodia to our troops in Afghanistan. <laughs> so I've tried to go after him off of this to get him to stop putting my picture in the ads for the fake reunion shows and quit stealing and everything else. And so they countersued over that and want to drag me to court again now saying that they want damages because I didn't promote the reunion tour and didn't promote the scab well, versions of the album. And from what I see, what I have, the way I read the documents is they want a legal ruling. They own my name, my face, my voice, my lyrics, my music, and my collage art and everything else. And so that's where it sits today. It just never ends. And I'm way the hell past broke and Alternative Tentacles is hanging by a thread the second oldest punk label in the world, and one of the few who pays their bands fairly and on time, and this is the reward we get. So anyway, if you see that stuff on DK Music or the DVDs on MVD, keep in mind I did not authorize it, I have nothing to do with it, I see next to nothing from it, and keep in mind where the money's really going and the mentality behind it before you allow a toxic substance like that into your home. That's why God gave us file sharing. But, Andy, but, but also, to try and get out of the hole here, we still do have, for those who want to show us some support, the Alternative Tentacles Legal Defense Fund. If you want to help us out at all, it's at alternativetentacles.com on our website. Hopefully enough said about that ugly tale for tonight. Other ugly tales abound as far as doctoring the news and lying to keep Gulf War the sequel going right now. How many of you saw the pictures of the dancing happy Iraqis pulling down the statue of Saddam Hussein in Baghdad? How many of you saw the aerial shot, I think it was in The Guardian over here, I've seen it other places too, of the square on that day and there's hardly anyone there. And U.S. soldiers are helping, if not totally the ones, pulling down the statue. Smellier still is the dramatic feel-good story of saving Private Lynch. 
heard of that one? Jessica Lynch, the female soldier who supposedly was shot full of holes by the Iraqis and then even stabbed when they got to her and then taken to the hospital in spite of that for some weird reason. But no, the American commandos stormed in and blew the Iraqi army around the hospital away and spirited Jessica Lynch back to safety right under Saddam's nose. What a feel-good story. This is why we go to war for heroes, right? Well, she's already gotten a million bucks advance for the book on the subject, on her life, and one problem, according to the BBC and the New York Times, among others, the story is false. And what really happened, according to the Iraqi doctor's medical records and the American doctors who looked at her afterwards, no bullet holes, no stab wounds, but a broken thigh, a broken arm, a dislocated ankle, consistent with turning over in your Jeep into a ditch or something. <laughs> and the Iraqis, apparently, when they realized what they had, tried to defy Saddam Hussein and get her back to the Americans, and even had her way to, uh, back to the Amer on her way back to the American lines in an ambulance, and we fired on the ambulance. So then, turned back around, put her back in an Iraqi hospital to keep her, you know, to help her with her injuries, and then the Americans stormed the Baghdad hospital, knowing there were no Iraqi soldiers guarding it at all, armed to the teeth with blanks they were firing in every direction, and armed to the teeth with video cameras detailing the whole thing, piping it live over to Qatar and Pentagon headquarters, and then a little careful editing, just like the Republican convention, and over to CNN and the rest of the networks, and a total lie is born. And with that in mind, a piece of me has to at least wonder, has to at least ask, does Saddam Hussein even exist? <laughs> Did Osama bin Laden ever exist? We never found him either, did we? And isn't it a little too convenient to cook up a racial stereotype cartoon for everybody to hate? Ooh, it's that guy, the turban, the beard, the brown skin, the eyebrows. Ooh, this horrific attack and tragedy that killed so many innocent people is all the fault of one lunatic in a cave in the poorest country in the world. <laughs> but we spent so, we've wasted so much energy venting at this big boogeyman, the great big bad Osama wolf, instead of taking a long look at our foreign policy and how it could improve, we made Osama bin Laden an overnight pop star all over the Middle East. They, uh, have, they sell bags of candy with his picture on it in Pakistan. You can get Elvis posters of him in the market, too. And you can even get Osama mobile phones in the Middle East, where you turn it on and there's a smiling picture on the little screen, morphing into a little outline of a building with a dot hitting it, and then kablooey! Hmm, that feels good, I'll make a call now. <laughs> Other people, unfortunately, see these things differently. And when I, I after five days after September 11th, I came over here to do one of these tours, and I couldn't believe the contrast between the American media coverage of the event and the coverage over here, which was much more in depth. Many more sides of the story aired, even in papers like the Times and even the Mirror, there was stuff you'd never find in an American paper, little did I know till I got back. And I've, I've joked for years that, uh, you know, our media has gotten so dumbed down because of all the corporate buyouts of broadcast and printed media that we might as well be in the Soviet Union where the only newspaper people got was Pravda. Eight pages a day of all the communists thought you needed to know. Well, we're there, folks.
And to prove my point, let me go get something I didn't bring out on stage. I'll be right back. I'll be right back. You haven't seen this before because this is my first Glasgow show for the spoken word thing. All I have to do is figure out where I put it. Ah, here we go. Here we are. Instead of getting news we can use, we are fed an unending diet of things like, who deserves to die? Can we still believe in miracles? Oh, here's one to keep people hiding under their beds when we can't have terrorist alerts anymore and there isn't a uh, government manufactured and manipulated drug crisis and all. Cyberporn. <laughs> An exclusive new time study shows how pervasive and wild it really is. Can we protect our kids and free speech? And time says, hell no, get rid of free speech. Too much of that underground and alternative press and people quit and realize how much this magazine lies and not buy it anymore. And sure enough, it was exposed within a week that the person who wrote this article was not a regular time journalist at all, but a graduate student at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, who was doing a study on how to get started in the cyber porn business. <laughs> Did time retract the story? No. Instead, they gave us the new age of angels. 69% of Americans believe they exist. going on? And what in heaven is going on when they were so hell-bent on keeping any actual issues out of the 1996 presidential election, all I could come up with for a story was Hillary versus Liddy, Mrs. Dole, who will be the better first lady. And how many of you, if, if you even remember Robert Dole at all, who ran against Clinton in 1996 and whatnot, kind of the Captain Queeg and everything, complete with a, something he was always clutching and everything? Well, guess what he does now? <laughs> Hi, I'm Bob Dole. Yeah, he's a spokesman for Viagra. I'm Bob Dole. Remember when I used to be the meanest, grumpiest, badass in Congress and my nickname was Mr. Gridlock? I was so obsessed with power that I wouldn't stop until I had it all. But now that my wiener works again, <laughs> life is good. Oh, I don't need all that power anymore. Thanks to my little blue friend. Special report. Are music and movies killing America's soul? I hope so. Somebody better be killing America's soul when their idea of what our soul should revolve around with global warming, war, no, that's not a problem. You need to worry about staying forever young. Or even more important, who's going to win on Survivor? That's what's newsworthy. What else have we got? Oh, oh yeah. Right when Bush rams the first Iraq resolution through the UN about, no, coming up a year ago, early November of 2002, does that make the cover? No. Newspeak, excuse me, Newsweek, says it's much more important to have why TV is good for kids. <laughs> Then a week later, after the 2002 elections are carefully manipulated by all this, Top Gun, that's the new name for the president, Top Gun. Oh, this is why when you have things like a Guardian and others, it's a damn good thing to hang on to because we have nothing like that. 
Gulf War number one, they couldn't even leave the little kids alone. Operation Desert Storm Bubblegum Cars. No gum inside, but instead of sports heroes, the David Beckhams of the day, you get Admiral Frank Kelso. General Schwarzkopf Gulf War. Oh, here's the Missile Control Center. Gee, it looks like a great big video game. You should enlist in the military. The state-of-the-art stealth fighter bomber. So state-of-the-art, a $2 billion Batman plane that doesn't even work. You can't fly it in the rain. So invisible that Milosevic's people shot one down in Kosovo. Here's the Tomahawk missile in flight, looking a lot like a flying vibrator as it streaks across the pubic hair brown mountains. Of course, a Top Gun card. A high fashion shot of carpet bombing. Yeah. And another rival company, the Desert Storm Pro Set, under intelligence file, they list Christianity. That is what passes for impartial journalism where I come from. No, it is not a good thing. Not at all. As far as I'm concerned, in spite of Tipper Gore and right-wing religious extremists and the attacks on raves going on legally in both of our countries and uh, Jack Straw and David Blunkett's total intolerance of any culture that they can't deal with, I think Corporate-owned mass news media deliberately leaving important stories and facts out of the news, that is the worst form of censorship going on today. Yeah. Our version of Pravda, I guess I'll get this out after all, is the USA Today. And right when they had that whole scare of the Washington, D.C. sniper and everything, oh my God, who's the sniper? Who's the sniper? Which I was thinking, what do you want to bet it's Bush's kids? <laughs> but here's how they covered that one. Weekend plans fall victim to sniper fears. Oh my God, the weekend! They can't kill the weekend! First the Twin Towers, now the weekend. Don't oh, what to do? But as good as some of your media is over here, also right after September 11th, there were the exceptions. <laughs> It's, it's an issue of the sun, the most popular paper here, from what I'm told. And it says, Queen has rubber duck in her bath. As through the full page as it bubble bath. Visualizing the queen in bubble bath is kind of weird to me. Oh, man. <laughs> Maybe she should bleach her hair blonde and start painting herself up like Mae West or something. That would be interesting. Anyway, moving right along here. Uh, okay, after about, I can't remember, six weeks or two months or something, um, I went back home a, a couple months after September 11th thinking that people were back home were privy to all the same information I was picking up over here, but even the things I thought would have to have made the news over there, they go, what, what, I never heard of that, never heard anything about that, such as two Guardian stories about a very interesting informal diplomatic gathering in a hotel in Berlin on July 2001, a couple months before September 11th, United States there, Russia, Pakistan, Iran, and uh, Northern Alliance from Afghanistan, Taliban invited but didn't show up apparently. Anyway, according to The Guardian, the American representative came right out and said to everybody else, yo, we're getting ready to invade Afghanistan and take out Osama bin Laden and didn't seem to care if the Pakistani representative took that news back to the Taliban, which The Guardian reported that he did. Another interesting one, 
was uh, May of 2002. I was over here again, and all over the place, even in uh, some of the other, some of the tabloid papers, was the report of the interview that Crown Prince Abdullah, the de facto ruler of Saudi Arabia, gave in France on his way home from the Bush Ranch in Texas. Abdullah apparently is the ruler of Saudi Arabia now that King Fahd is kind of, his mind is going, he's real old, and he reportedly just spends most of his time watching cartoons. Which makes me wonder what was going on in his head when they sat him down in a chair for a photo opportunity with Donald Rumsfeld right before we invaded Afghanistan to show the Saudis were totally behind our attacks on the Islamic world and were totally down with us and all. I was thinking, what's going on in Fod's head? What show does he think he's watching? <laughs> Pinky in the brain! Here's this guy in the other chair talking about taking over the world. <laughs> anyway, Abdullah said in this interview in France, he tried to be really diplomatic and everything and nice about it, but what he basically said was, he couldn't believe how out of it and clueless our president was when it came to Middle Eastern affairs. That instead of staying there 30 minutes to an hour to do the old photo op and handshake and go home, he had to sit there hour after hour after hour giving Bush a show and tell presentation on why the Palestinians were pissed off at the Israelis. <laughs> that Bush had no idea. Although I can't say I'm too surprised. Has anybody else noticed that Bush doesn't seem to be any smarter than he was on September 10th of 2001? <laughs> I, I mean, the, the, the first, first when September 11th happened, they were, he, was disapp he disappeared most of the day. And they're saying, oh, well, we're, he's, we're keeping him in a secret place in Louisiana in case more hijackers hit, hit, chase Air Force One with an airliner or something. And then he said, oh, no, 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 we're hiding him in Nebraska. And I was thinking, marooned in Tuscaloosa, Alabama on September 11th, oh, no, 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 no. They've got him up at the Bush family palace in Kenny Bunkport in Maine. And he says, hey, hey, Pop, you told me that job was going to be easy. What do I do now? <laughs> If you notice that no matter how they package him, even in tightly controlled and scripted news and stuff, he always gives off the vibe that he knows he doesn't belong where he is. <laughs> My first exposure to the creature was when he was accepting his nomination at the Republican convention in Philadelphia in 2000. There he is on the television screen behind a podium that looked like it was too big for him. You know, plastic made to look like gray marble or something. And he came across as some spoiled, wealthy fraternity, rich kid trying to get on the college debate team. We're going to make America strong and America proud. I will restore honesty and dignity to the Oval Office in the White House. <laughs> Want my Bush collection? <laughs> this was the guy who, then, even then, had never been to Europe, ever, before he started running for president and called Greeks Grecians, <laughs> Kosovians, called Jimmy Carter a European-style socialist, <laughs> and thought Friends was a movie and the Taliban was a rock band. <laughs> He was asked what his favorite book was, repeatedly, repeatedly, because he couldn't come up with a single book. Finally, he blurted out that it was a children's book that meant a lot to him when he was a little kid, but it turned out that book was published in the mid-60s while he was going to college. <laughs> and yet, he calls himself the education president who's going to improve our schools and make Americans as smart as people in the rest of the world so they're not dumb enough to vote for him and Arnold anymore, perhaps. <laughs> Who knows? But, and his wife Laura says, uh, oh, she heard do good, feel good project. His first lady is going to be education and literacy. Maybe because of what snores on the other side of the bed at night. Bush on education. 
rarely is a question asked, is our children learning? <laughs> I know, the human being and fish can coexist peacefully. <laughs> Bush on the Middle East. It is clear our nation is reliant upon big foreign oil. More and more of our imports come from overseas. <laughs> Bush talking tough to Saddam Hussein a little over a year ago. You disarm or we will. <laughs> he can't find Saddam, he actually did give one press conference, and they asked him about that, and his answer was, I don't know how close we are to getting Saddam Hussein. You know, it's closer than we were yesterday, I guess. All I know is, we're out on the hunt. And then, when asked about how his war scams and everything else have driven the American economy so far down the toilet, and the federal budget deficits are even worse than Reagan's, I think even double is, well, Bush says, well, part of the deficit, no question, was caused by taxes. <laughs> about 25% of the deficit. The other 75 to 50% caused by lack of revenue. <laughs> and 25% caused by additional spending on the war on terror, which adds up to 125%. <laughs> Families is where our nation finds hope, where wings take dreams. <laughs> After that one, even his spin doctors, Carl Rove and all, had to jump in and say, hey, 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 don't you go calling our candidates stupid. That's picking on the disabled. He's just dyslexic. And I mean no ill will towards anybody who suffers from dyslexia. There's at least two in my extended family, and they've been through hell because of it. But should we allow somebody who may see things backwards or in a mirror image to have their own fingers on weapons of mass destruction? <laughs> hey, Remy! Hey, Connelisa! Hey, Uncle Dick! Come here! Look what I found in the corner in the Oval Office! Look at all these buttons! Let's see what they do. You just launched nuclear missiles at China, sir. Oh, well, guess I better bring them back. Uh, you just launched, you just pushed the button that says they can't be brought back, sir. Really? Oh, that's too bad. Uh, let's go watch some baseball. Oh, here we are. Then, Bush admitted, right, right at the end of August, that he doesn't even bother reading the newspaper, let alone books or anything. I glance at the headlines just to kind of a flavor for what's moving. I rarely read the stories and get briefed by people who are probably read the news themselves. <laughs> Will the highways on the internet become more few? <laughs> I know how hard it is for you to put food on your family. <laughs> I haven't had this much fun with creative mutilation of the English language since my sophomore year in high school when I had this geometry teacher whose parents were from Norway, but he was from Minnesota, and talked like all the characters in the Fargo movie. <laughs> and he had baggy Charlie Chaplin pants in the bell-bottom 70s and a flannel hunting shirt with a white shirt and a skinny black tie underneath and a disproportionately small turtley head on top with little wavy widow's peak hair, and started out uh, seemingly like any other math class for several weeks, but then it got interesting. Now, we're talking about the angle C, A, B. Excuse me, B. Angle, ain't we? We am I having a time today? And then it grew and grew and grew. 
And luckily, me and another person in an earlier class period began writing his quotes down. By the end of the year, I had a notebook an inch and a half thick of hundreds of these things, such as his adventures in trying to say congruent triangles. Now, we working with Klangagi Troopers. No, 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 no. Congruent Tranglers, er, Congruent Trongers, er, Congruent, er, er, drop of your, where was her? Excuse me, I. Oh, yes, Tranglers. No, oh, Tranglers. Oh, no, Trianglers. Oh, I can't even try. Failing grade became this one day. We got a bake. Our Nabernus clocks gap cards, but all I got was a flailing grood. Oh, flabby grab, Pip on Quaker Bean, flailing grunt. Er, oh, great group, 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 great and then the Freudian slips about food, sex, and Watergate began to appear. Do fluorescent lights save energy? Well, it depends a lot on the boobs. Er, gloves, balls that you use. So let's plug in the cabbage, nig nig, a bobberonk, er, values, and sue what we can be. And then finally, one day he came out and asked the class, over Deompus Blabby Dwarf. <laughs> Not one word of English left in the whole sentence. And I asked people in Oslo and Bergen on this tour, is this really Norwegian? No. <laughs> Nor is asking the class, Poofy Snibble Abby Glob, Norwegian, or bursting into song in the middle of a problem, singing rubber gloves, rubber gloves, sauteed over night little fire. Oh, rubber gloves, rubber gloves, Sauteed over open fire. Why do? Can't? Shouldn't I eat it? Extends X. We both got another quadratic. So we all equal 32. Bush. No, nope, not gonna be a press conference today. Not in English, not in French, not in Mexican. <laughs> I'm gonna expand child care, even to those who don't have children. <laughs> it's clearly a budget. It's got a lot of numbers in it. <laughs> Bush comes to England. He meets Charlotte Church. So, what state is Wales in? <laughs> I said it's a separate country next to England, and he went, oh, okay. And then in the East End of London, in a classroom full of little kids, one of them asked him, what's the White House like? It is white. <laughs> How did this guy get buttered and squirted through Yale and Harvard and other very diff difficult universities, hard to get into, even harder to graduate from, yet they brought him back to Yale to give the commencement address to the graduating class in the spring of 2001. And what, what was his advice to them? And to the C students, I say, you too can be president of the United States. <laughs> that is the attitude of the man leading us into war. Anyway, more, more suppressed things that people in America didn't find out about that were over the news here I thought was in, were interesting, such as when our airspace was still supposed to be tightly controlled about a week after September 11th, we allowed in a chartered Saudi airliner to hop around different cities to pick up members of the Bin Laden family and fly them safely home to Saudi Arabia. And how many of you know that the Bush family and the Bin Laden family have a business relationship dating back almost 25 years? And one of the investors in King George II's first of many failed business ventures, our Busto Energy, was none other than Salem Bin Laden, Osama's older brother who has since died. And they also connect up through a shadowy corporation called the Carlyle Group, who's now the 11th largest defense contractor in the United States, 
and they don't really, they, they came out of nowhere, they just specialize in buying out other manufacturers of weapons of mass destruction and making them more profitable. And they got a really big contract in the war on terrorism and invading Iraq to oh, 400... No, no. For, oh, we've got somebody really smart tonight. No. <laughs> anyway... Okay, Carlisle, they got $450 million to build what they call the, the Crusader. Real diplomatic name for a weapon you want to use on the Middle East. Supposedly the biggest, most badass tank ever built. But you need a bulldozer to clear a path for it through the battlefield. $450 million. And also cleaning up, as I digress even further, what is the Lockheed Corporation, who's finally found a use for their Virginia-class submarine, according to Greg Pallas, BBC guy and Guardian guy and all that. Um, the the Virginia-class sub apparently is as large as a Zeppelin hangar or something, designed to beat up on the big, bad, communist Soviet Navy. It's some huge old hulking relic from the Cold War. But now, says Lockheed, well, you need them for invading the Middle East. You need them now more than ever. Why? Because just put nine Marines inside a torpedo, fire the torpedo over the enemy lines, and they're behind the enemy lines, right? Well, here you are defending your homeland in the marshes in southern Iraq, and ooh, there goes a great big torpedo, but instead of exploding, clunk, 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 and then a hatch opens just like those rockets from the 50s sci-fi movies, and out stagger nine Marines with stars going around their heads as they're led off to prisoner of war camps, or worse. Well, Carlisle Group is run by Frank Carlucci, who is one of Reagan's defense secretaries and should still be in jail for his Contragate crimes. Also on the board, James Baker III, who was Daddy Bush's Secretary of State and a campaign dirty tricks specialist who uh, helped fix things in Florida when they didn't go quite according to plan for Georgia Jr. And also on the board is John Major, the, the one who came in after Thatcher and all, before our lovely friend Blair, and also Fidel Ramos, the old president of the Philippines, also Colin Powell, who wasn't on the board but did promotional work for him before he was Secretary of State, and guess who gets $800,000 in Carlisle stock per promotional appearance? King George Bush the first, the president's father, and also investing in Carlisle until somebody shined a light on it after September 11th when they pulled it out. Millions in Carlisle startup money came from the Bin Laden family. And according to Michael Moore, when Daddy Bush goes over to Saudi Arabia to drum up business for Carlisle, he crashes in the Bin Laden family palace. More recently, new Guardian story from last August I found real uh, eyebrow raising, August 23rd, reported that Bush and Pervez Musharraf, the dictator of Pakistan, made a little deal together not to capture Osama bin Laden, to just let him run back there in the woods till whenever because they were so scared of what would happen to Musharraf if people hit the streets after bin Laden got killed or seized or whatever. I haven't seen anybody else pick up on that story. Who knows? Maybe it's because it's not true, but I can't get it out of my mind. But what we're supposed to have in our mind instead is to feel so good about Iraq because now we've achieved regime change. Remember that term? Now we must have regime change. Why Saddam? Why now? Don't other countries need a regime change too? Like Saudi Arabia, like China, like Israel, like the United States of America? And perhaps Great Britain too. Bush says, Come on, bro. Pay to see. Have a talk.
I hope I don't wind up having to ask you to leave, but you are pissing a lot of people off. But Bush says, no. Saddam Hussein. Anyway, Bush says we need regime change because, and I saw him cock his head on CNN and say this with a little smirk on his mouth, Saddam Hussein is an evil man. And he is an evil man. And I'm glad that I don't live in a country that was run by Saddam Hussein, or I would have been dead long ago, and many of you would too. But he's the same evil man he was for the past 13 years when he didn't attack us or his neighbors, and the same evil man he was in the 1980s when we were the ones supplying him the weapons of mass destruction. selling him his armaments, his artillery, his computers. We sold him gunboats. We sold him anthrax. We sold him pesticides and chemicals knowing full well he was going to make them into germ bombs. We sold him the botulism and we even sold him bubonic plague. No questions asked. And... You don't fucking let him! <laughs> 1988, well, by we, I might mean both your countries. Who knows? See if we, see if Britain was involved in pumping up Saddam too. I'll bet you any Britain was. Yeah. After all, many companies based here have Americans on their board of directors or are subsidiaries of American companies or vice versa, or subsidiaries of the occasional British company, whatever. Anyway, by 1988, the, it, it was widely reported and documented that Saddam had destroyed hundreds of Kurdish villages, gassed thousands of people, both Iranians and his own. What was the American response under the Reagan administration? Add on a $500 million agricultural subsidy. <laughs> And then when Daddy Bush came in a year later, we doubled it to a $1 billion agricultural subsidy. Maybe that's why of this huge report, what was almost 12,000 pages of documents that Saddam gave to the United Nations right before we blew the country up and all, documenting the status of the weapons program, Americans immediately yanked away 8,000 of those pages and classified them as top secret. But luckily, the Iraqis still had their master and leaked it to the media anyway, because in those 8,000 pages was all the American companies, maybe some British ones too, that were selling Saddam his weapons. Honeywell, Hewlett Packard, the computer company, DuPont Chemicals, Bechtel Construction, Eastman Kodak, U.S. Department of Agriculture, United States Department of Energy, both our nuke labs and Los, Los Alamos and Lawrence Livermore implicated. And guess who sealed the deal back in 1983 to open up business with Saddam Hussein? Went over there and shook his hand as the cameras clicked. Donald Rumsfeld. Reagan's special envoy to the Middle East. And we loved Saddam so much, we didn't even care that the Saudis had given him $7 billion to try and develop an atomic bomb. He felt so down with us that he saw no problem in telling our ambassador to Iraq he was about to invade Kuwait. To which April Glaspie, the ambassador, replied, we have no opinion on your border dispute with Kuwait. Come on in. He goes on in. Reporters are chasing Daddy Bush, wondering if the president's going to do anything. He waved him off because he wanted to finish his golf game. <laughs> and don't forget that before we went in this time, Saddam was complying and coughing up what little weapons of mass destruction he had left. And according to Scott Ritter, who was chief 
United Nations weapons inspector before Hans Blix, the one who was the inspect main inspector from 1991 at the end of the Gulf War till 1998 when uh, the inspectors were thrown out after some were accused of spying for the Americans. Ritter has said repeatedly that the, the, in his uh, expert opinion, the United Nations inspectors confiscated and destroyed 90 to 95 percent of Saddam's weapons. Yes. But we did that too. And what happens when that stuff gets in the atmosphere? From chemical plants and nuke plants and whatnot? Could that be a possible explanation for Gulf War Syndrome? Where American soldiers and veterans of the Gulf War began feeling real, real sick, splitting headaches, crossed vision, spaz attacks, oh, loss of bodily functions, cancer, and birth defects and whatnot, insanity in some cases as well, and the government still won't officially admit Gulf War Syndrome exists, but now of the 600,000 troops we send into the first Gulf War, 236,000 of them are on disability, up 10,000 from just a year ago, and 11,000 others, for whatever reason, have died. So if somebody you care about in your family or a friend is in the British military right now and is in danger of getting sent over there just because Blair can't admit he was so wrong in this case at all, it might be a good idea to advise them on how to desert or get the hell out of the armed forces before it gets any worse. Well, people join the Army in America because they're duped by ads telling them they're going to get job training and all, which is very attractive to get a Thankfully, no. I have no desire to be in the Army. Anyway, but that's the point is you may not get shot at if you're sent over there right now, but then again, you may, but you may come home very, very, very sick. Rumsfeld figured out a solution to that, though. He just didn't give any medical tests or blood tests to the soldiers before sending them to war this time in direct violation of American law. And is this really totally an oil scam? Or is there more? Check this out. There's a magazine called Harper's in America, and right at the front of every issue is a page called Harper's Index with all these mind-blowing facts, figures, and statistics and their sources. And they had a pretty wild one in spring of 2002 where they pointed out amount the United Snakes spends every year guarding our Persian Gulf oil supply. $50 billion. Value of the crude oil that comes from the Persian Gulf actually consumed by Americans, $19 billion. What is wrong with this picture? Especially when the whole time Saddam was public enemy number one, we put him under sanctions and didn't want other countries doing business with him. We were buying six, you know, all, we were buying over two-thirds of his oil. And the only reason he could pump the oil was an American company was paid $28 billion to put the whole oil pumping and processing infrastructure back together. A construction company called Halliburton, who was run at the time by Dick Cheney. Yeah. What I really think this boils down to is the curse of the wolf man. Let me explain. In uh, September of 2002, the uh, LA Times reported on a 1991 Pentagon study commissioned by Bush's father called the National Security Guideline, written by Paul Wolfowitz and Louis Libby, who goes by the nickname of Scooter. And Wolfman and Libby came up with a document so wildly paranoid, it said that because the communist evil empire had fallen and there was no more Soviet threat, the world was a vastly more dangerous place. And now all our allies needed to be treated as potential competitors who had to be prevented from, quote, aspiring to a greater regional or global role 
than we had in mind for them. And they also said that Americans intervening in other countries and sending in their military like we did in Iraq should be, quote, a constant feature of global affairs. Even Bush's father thought this report was insane. But did Wolfman and Scooter wind up in straitjackets in a padded cell? Uh, no. Wolfman is number two to Rumsfeld at the Defense Department and widely credited with being the architect of this whole damn Iraq war, and Scooter is Dick Cheney's chief of staff. They did have one important cheerleader back then, though, a general by the name of Colin Powell, testified before Congress that we needed this because, quote, I want to be the bully on the block. They tried to push this on Clinton, too, through a private group called Project for a New American Century that said that uh, we needed to invade Iraq immediately. United States troops should replace the UN troops all over the world and push towards controlling the globe. And all we needed was a new Pearl Harbor, quote unquote, to get the ball rolling. <laughs> Members of the Project for a New American Century included Donald Rumsfeld, Dick Cheney, the Wolfman, and others. Also, we've been coming to visit and deciding to stay all over the Middle East and putting up all these military bases. Saudi Arabia, Oman, Bahrain, Qatar, got one on the other side of Saudi Arabia in the little African country of Djibouti right at the bottom of the Red Sea got it in Afghanistan, big bases in Turkey. We've talked about keeping as many as four in Iraq, whether the Iraqis want us there or not. And we've got them in Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan and others. Why? Why are we so obsessed with putting up all these bases in that part of the world when the crude, that $19 billion worth of crude coming out of the Gulf is only 10% of the oil America burns up and wastes every year. Why is that 10% so important? Unless it is to implement and cement in the curse of the wolf man. Because, you know, two thirds or whatever the world's oil supply does sit right there and that means whoever controls it, says Dick Cheney, sits on top of the world economy. And that means, hey, well, maybe you've got North Sea oil, but hey, France, Germany, China, Japan, if you ever aspire to a greater regional or global role than we have in mind with you for you, think again, because now we can turn off the hose anytime we want to, and that means we've got you by the nuts. <laughs> that is the curse of the wolf man. On top of that, they've gotten so out of control, the, 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 maybe the most irresponsible Bush action of all has been, uh, th this is real quiet too, they announced that uh, because all those Star Wars tests kept failing for all the nuclear toys they want to put up in outer space, since so many tests have failed, now it's on fast track and we're just going to put them up there anyway. Nukes in space. Star Wars, in other words. Reagan's wet dream. What happens if one of those things malfunctions? What happens if it starts shooting at people or it just crashes back down to Earth as all satellites do eventually and blows like the Space Shuttle Columbia did? That could potentially, in the case of a nuclear warhead, scatter enough plutonium dust all over the Earth's atmosphere to kill damn near every breathing critter on Earth. I'm far more afraid of that than Osama, Saddam, and big bad North Korea combined. But they're doing it anyway. There may be something else at work here, too. According to William Grider, an economist who's done great work debunking the so-called benefits of globalization and predicted a lot of things economically that have actually happened, points out that the world economy's umbilical cord 
is attached to the currency of one country who can make as much of that money as they want to, which means the United Snakes controls world trade and gets to import goods and services cheaper than a lot of other people get to, unless a threat rises to the surface, such as in November 2000, one of the OPEC countries refused to accept dollars for their oil anymore and said they'd only take euros from now on. Iraq. And since that time, for whatever reason, the American dollar has declined by 17%. And now Iran is saying they're thinking about switching over to euros only. And just on cue, the American corporate media is starting to drum up stories about weapons of mass destruction we may have to get rid of in Iran. <laughs> now that's one way to send a message and go into Iraq and say, hey Saudis, hey Kuwait, don't you even think about converting to euros. Because the Achilles heel is, according to Greider and other economists, the American dollar is overvalued by 40% in the world economy, and what happens if people figure that out and the balloon pops? Oh my God, we won't be able to afford to implement the curse of the Wolfman anymore. We might not even be able to have two sport utility vehicles in every garage. But as far as the Wolfman goes and occupying all these places, what about the people who live there? The problem in Iraq is a classic example of what happens when everything gets planned by self-proclaimed experts hiding in think tanks in Washington or Stanford University or wherever, you know, building hypothetical models and computer studies and writing books only read by each other on how to manage the little people in other parts of the world without ever talking to them or visiting their countries at all. Thus, the Bush Cowboys planned the attack on Iraq for at least a year, probably more, I think, but didn't even start planning for the aftermath until right before the war. Don't worry, they're pussies, says the Rumsfeldians. We'll be out of there in three months. Plus, Saddam's army is two-thirds smaller than it was in the first Gulf War. He's cut his military budget by 90%, like we should. And does that sound like an immediate terrorist threat to you? Well, Cheney then said, well, we have to go in and kill Iraq because if we go in there, we will be greeted as liberators. <laughs> greeted as liberators in spite of the sanctions that we slapped on them after Gulf War number one and the no-fly zone that America and Blair have put in, put in there all that time, which cut off their food, cut off a lot of medicine, no chlorine allowed to clean up the water, no ambulances allowed, not even pencils allowed for some weird reason. And the estimated death toll from the Iraqi sanctions of people starving to death and dying from perfectly preventable diseases like diarrhea in little kids and stuff. Death toll, conservative estimate, half a million, not so conservative between one and two million. That's not fighting terrorism, that's genocide. Yeah. And people there know that. people on that scale, you are not going to be welcomed as liberators, especially because it was Bush's own father who lied to the Shiites in the South and the Kurds in the North after Gulf War number one saying, hey, rise up against Saddam Hussein and we'll help you. They rose up, we didn't help, they died. Last thing we wanted over there, after all, is democracy. You have a really free election in almost any country in that part of the world. Who do you think is going to win? Whoever vows to wage the most jihad against the occupying infidels. And on top of that little ticking bomb, keep in mind the other big one, and that is throughout the Middle East where they all hate us so much, half the population is under 25 and there's not a whole lot of growth in the job prospects going on. Richard Hass, who works right under Colin Powell at the State Department, said, and this is another real quote, our policy 
is to get rid of Saddam Hussein, not his regime. In other words, somehow we thought if we went in there, his whole army and secret police would turn around and do the same dirty work for us. For some reason, that didn't happen, so we just fired them all on a whim instead. And the new Saddam we put in, or tried to, or are still trying to, the head of the governing council, Ahmed Shalabi, who had not set foot in Iraq since 1956, when he left the country as a teenager. Plus, he's still on the run from a 22-year prison sentence in Jordan for stealing $30 million from his own bank, Yet Rumsfeld and Wolfman have repeatedly pointed to Chalabi as their main expert source of how well the war was going to go when we invaded Iraq. Obviously, the guy is a con man. Didn't Wolfman and Rumsfeld figure he might be conning them too? No. We're not greeted as liberators. The whole country is going stark raving bonkers at this point. The Iraqis feel lied to, their culture stolen and destroyed. 400,000 soldiers were laid off with no reemployment program, no pension, nothing. 100,000 civil servants who kept the country running in the various government departments all fired with nobody replacing them. And we even took guns and badges away from all the local cops but left the guns in the hands of hundreds of thousands of civilians who are now using them for crime and for killing us. Electricity is barely coming on, only now. The phone system, as last I've heard, still doesn't work at all. Forget about clean running water or any other amenities, but we sure have been vigilant about guarding the oil ministry building, which is as big as one of the big Vegas hotels. It is in perfect condition, while all around it, ruins. To the point where we just stood idly by as Iraqis stormed and looted the Iraqi National Museum, which was considered the jewel of the Middle East as far as their collection of ancient artifacts going back to the very dawn of what we call our civilization. Oldest calendar was there, but not anymore, apparently. Some reports are all 13,000 stolen items miraculously returned, but other reports say no, they're gone, the place is smashed, and just to top it off, they burned the library too. The National Library. What better way to completely break a people's spiritual back and destroy their culture? Rumsfeld said when he was asked, why are you allowing this to happen? Eh, freedom is untidy. <laughs> <laughs> then one of his generals, Buford Blunt III, I kid you not, said that he didn't intervene because, well, they weren't threatening soldiers, they were just stealing something. We didn't, to this day, we have not tightened down Saddam Hussein's old arsenals and military bases, so weapons of medium mass destruction are flying out the door to who knows where. We aren't even stopping them. And all the leftover nuclear material from his failed experiments, that's been stolen now. You can make that into a dirty bomb, so to speak, to blow radiation into a large area of a city. Didn't lock that down either. Big machines out of factories, bowl unbolted from the floor, loaded onto trucks, which probably required cranes, stolen out of the country because nobody was doing anything to stop it. So much copper has been stripped from power plants, the price of copper in the Middle East has dropped. And we even let them loot the central bank over a period of several days. And, you know, people lost their savings, their safe deposit box stuff, and even the machines that printed the currency, the dinar, also disappeared. Crime, as you might guess, with no police force for all practical purposes, has gone through the ceiling. Murders, robberies, extortion, rape, women mainly stay indoors and keep their girls away from anybody who might jump them outside, not just to kidnap and rape them, but also to kidnap. Because kidnapping children and adults is one of the few 
thriving growth industries in Iraq at the moment. A lot of this is documented by the Occupation Watch Center, who's been sending regular citizens over there on fact-finding missions, uh, talk to the Iraqis, bring back information, photographs, etc. And their website is occupationwatch.org. And one interesting point they make is that part of the reason the Iraqis are so pissed off is because Saddam Hussein had the electricity and the phones up and running within two months. But not this time, no, it's not the military's job. And no electricity means we've left 27 million people with no way to store perishable food, so it rots, can't turn on the air conditioning in the 130 degree Fahrenheit heat, can't run your businesses, can't run your factories, so they get looted, you can't pump gas, so the buses don't run, very few taxis run, and cars that do run are getting jacked a lot. You can't pump water, which also means you can't run your sewage treatment plants, which means at present, two million or more shits a day are flowing from Baghdad straight into the Tigris River, downstream to where people drink the water, fish in the water, and swim in the water. The United Nations Food for Oil program, which according to UNICEF, feeds all the 27 million people in Iraq, well, we've announced that it ends November 21st. Then what takes over? The magic of private enterprise. Bush and Rumsfeld and Arnold style, I guess. In a country where now it's 63% unemployment, rent control laws, which restrict under Saddam Hussein, are all gone. So landlords are throwing people out of their homes in mass, winding up many of them in big giant homeless camps to made out of the bombed out ministry buildings. The Palestinians who used to get refuge from uh, what was going on with Israel in Iraq have now been exiled to tent cities in the desert. Children we claim we liberated from Saddam's orphanages now beg in the street but there's no squatters to be found, according to Occupation Watch, in Saddam's lavish palaces, which are mostly pretty much intact, occupied by Texas businessmen, good friends of Dick Cheney and George Bush. And this is, might be why they're not allowing any of the normal relief organizations who are skilled and trained in fixing up countries after earthquakes and floods and wars. For the most part, we won't let them in. We won't let the United Nations weapons inspections teams back in. And instead, everybody, including Shalabi and the council, must take orders from the emperor we put in, an American named L. Paul Bremer, who used to work for Henry Kissinger, <laughs> and announced clear back in May, Iraq is open for business. And he didn't mean Iraqi business, he meant American business. Not even British until Blair whined and groveled before Bush at one of their joint prayer sessions or whatever. <laughs> and, uh, Few of them got let in, but Halliburton once again got the contract to put the oil infrastructure back together, and the deal was signed 12 days before the war began. Bechtel Construction, I guess it is in charge of the electricity and maybe the water, which may explain why it doesn't work, because they have to do their expert studies. They have to figure out how to bleed your coffers and our coffers dry and pocket most of the money. The Iraqi people be damned. What do they care if it gets done on time? Like the Texas businessmen, they can just get their water flowed in in bottles from Kuwait, send the dry cleaning back on the plane to be done and all. Multinationals only allowed for the Iraqi people's oil. One Bechtel guy would ask, you know, why haven't any of the Iraqi experts who know how the electricity grid is put together been allowed to put it back together? Well, they wanted us to give them tools and money and they do the work. You can't just do that. Bremer has announced that it will cost $14 billion to bring Iraqis back their water supply and take four years. So while the Iraqis wait for basic necessities, 
Our occupation forces have concentrated their energy elsewhere. Big humanitarian things like crossing Saddam out of school books. Even bigger humanitarian things, like when we liberated the Baghdad airport, we shot it to pieces. But not before stripping and looting the duty-free shops and five Boeing airplanes that were on the ground. To which a US military official justified that by saying, oh, well, these are just bored soldiers. <laughs> April 15th, in the city of Mosul, people decided to try out their newfound freedom and democracy and demonstrated against the first speech by the mayor the Americans had appointed. The Americans responded by shooting 10 protesters dead and wounding 100 more. Two weeks later in Fallujah, we killed 15 protesters. Now we're killing an average of 28 Iraqis a day. And slowly but surely, it's kind of turning into Vietnam, too. The troops have been there a long time now. They were told they'd be coming right home. They're freaking out. They're tired. They're worn thin. They're scared. And they're very, very trigger conscious because more and more people are getting shot at, kind of like Vietnam. Where the same thing going on, well, you can't tell who the enemy is. They all look alike. They'll be your friend one day and then kill you the next. What do you do? Well, what our people have been doing is sometimes they hear a shot, and they get so freaked out, they just turn around and fire. Sometimes hundreds of rounds a second into a large building, so much for the building and everything in it. Journalists have not fared much better either. In the Afghan war, one of the first things we bombed in Kabul was the Al Jazeera Center. You know, the Arab TV network and all blew them up. April 15th, once again, the United States Marines stormed the Palestine Hotel in Baghdad, where a lot of the journalists were staying, kicked in the doors of their rooms and put M16, but, uh, M16 barrels to the head of people like reporters from CNN and Turkish TV, Japanese TV, saying, well, we're looking for people not friendly to the United States. A week earlier, they made their point by pulling a tank up to the entrance of the Palestine Hotel and firing a shell inside, killing two journalists and wounding three more. Amnesty International is now condemning us and by extension Britain for violating international law again and again and again. Last August, even Chalabi asked that the troops pull out of the cities and leave the people there alone. Sergio Vieira de Mello, the uh, Brazilian uh, head of the UN mission there until he was killed in the bombing, that very night, he was planning to release a statement condemning the recklessness of the military. Just like Vietnam, the problem is, now that we've conquered the place, what do we do with it? We own it now. It's our property. We break it. We bought it. Hey, Pop, what do we do now? <laughs> is this any way to win a war on terrorism? There's no way we will ever win a war on terrorism. Israel has been trying to win their war on terrorism from the moment of their birth. Have they won yet? Has the British Army won their war on terrorism in Northern Ireland? I don't think so. Yet Bush and his cowboys and Blair tagging along thought they could take on the entire world with no experience in the field. Hey, Pop, what do we do now? <laughs> Or more, stay tuned. I think right now we ought to take a little bit of a break and I'll see you in a few minutes. Fund. So, and I, and you know, to try and restore some semblance of dignity and respect to dead Kennedys and keep corporate plundering from going too far. And I know not everybody has any money and other people need it too, so no obligation. But anything put here, the shoe and I will be very thankful.
Contributions to the shoe fund. I, you've been saved now. Put your hands on the screen and miracles will come to you. Such as watching Blair spontaneously come. What is this thing? Any, this thing? But nobody signed the petition. It's blank. There's more of them. Oh, uh, you guys do this first. I'll get it later here. No, pass around. Anyway, um, <laughs> hey, Pop, what do we do now? For Bush, this seems to me nothing can be cured. There is no problem that can't be cured without more advertising, marketing, and spin. Afghanistan? Eh, forget them. They don't matter anymore. Which is kind of too bad, considering what we've done to them. Yeah. Basically abandoned the whole place and just called it a victory because our little puppet president, Hamid Karzai, the guy in the cute little hat, made out of lamb stomach linings, apparently. We used to work for Unical, by the way, too. Ahmed Karzai is basically mayor of Kabul during daylight hours, and otherwise anything goes. The warlords are back at it in the rest of the country, extortion, all kinds of horrible things done to women, and opium production went up 2,000% last year, according to the United Nations and all. Bin Laden? A real threat? No, no, no. He doesn't matter anymore either. Because now we have, well, I will keep my promise and load you down with diamonds. Operation Iraqi Freedom. <laughs> the coalition forces. A war of liberation. They still call Afghanistan Operation Enduring Freedom. We've put 150 million bucks into advertising ourselves in Middle Eastern Arab media outlets. A lot of good that's done. We even hired an ad executive named Charlotte Beers to market the Iraq war to the Arab street, as they put it. After all, she did a great job selling head and shoulder shampoo and Uncle Ben's rice. And this time it didn't work, so she was fired. But now we're putting out a new slick youth culture magazine over there. You know, it's not called Britney Unveiled, but it might as well be. But the name of the magazine is Hi! To which kiosk owners apparently are replying the same as their customers. Bye. On the home front, Time came to shore things up when Jessica Lynch was fading out of the picture a little bit. Well, let's just repackage the president again instead and have that cinematic landing Jerry Bruckheimer would be proud of on the aircraft carrier in a tail hook landing and out comes Bush in his airman flight suit and struts down the aircraft carrier in his parachute suit crisscrossing right above his package so it sticks out oh so far and announces clear last May the war is over. A lot of good that did, but it sure felt good, didn't it? There he is going to address the troops in the Persian Gulf, except that the plane landed on the aircraft carrier off the coast of San Diego, California. <laughs> and had to circle for 23 hours waiting for him to make sure that uh, the lighting was just right as the sun was setting and you couldn't see any of San Diego in the background. 
so that George W. Bush could uh, pretend he was top gun in hopes that the rest of the country would pretend he was top gun too. I mean, I'm sorry, but I just don't have any confidence in Bush or his people to show any long-term wisdom or do the right thing in this situation. I mean, I can't shake this vision that, him, that haunts me and has kept me awake at night of Bush running around loose in the war room or a loose on the grounds of Camp David with a shirt pulled up over his head like Beavis in the cartoon. I'm the great Cornholio! I'm the great Cornholio! And then Powell or Cheney grabs him by the collar. Sit down, George. We have wars to plan. We have countries to annihilate. We have people to kill. Then can we watch some baseball? Bush said, Israel and Palestine, oh, well, no problem anymore. Here's the roadmap for peace. And he said he knew it would work because he was going to ride herd, as he put it over the, uh, the Palestinians and the Israelis. Ride herd being an old cowboy expression for uh, cattle drives and stuff. Very interesting because Bush doesn't know how to ride a horse. <laughs> Which Vladimir Putin found out the hard way when he came to the Bush Ranch in Texas and, oh, I always wanted to ride a horse in the Old West. Oh, we don't have any of those here. Well, here, I'll take you around the ranch in my golf cart called Gator. <laughs> so instead, just like Saddam Hussein predicted, we're sinking deeper and deeper and deeper into Vietnam-style guerrilla warfare. The American troops attacked an average of 30 times a day now, the fuse burning not just in the cabin in Big Rock Canyon, but all over the world. We won. We won quick. But now we get to pay for it the rest of our lives. The more we export arms and violence to the Middle East, the less safe and secure we are at home. And look what a great job Bush did with all the sympathy that came our way after September 11th. Now, I go over here. I haven't noticed as much this time, I admit, but last time when I was over here, I got more dirty looks in train stations and at markets as soon as an American accent came out of my mouth than I, oh, she applauds, than I ever have before. Oh, oh, I see. Well, <laughs> I mean, and then um, they ran a big thing in the USA Today about American tourists getting yelled at and cornered and argued with and even spit on in Europe because of Bush, and their solution was tips for blending in. <laughs> Outside our borders, George Bush may well be the most hated president in American history. As Bill Maher, the political comedian, puts it, how bad do you have to suck to lose a popularity contest with Saddam Hussein? <laughs> Well, one way is by taking a country that is not a terrorist threat and turning it into one. And even if we kill off every single follower of Saddam Hussein and every single person who has ever down with bin Laden, what will their kids be like? What will their kids be like? Even before we went into Iraq, it was reported that People were starting to leave Egypt, walk out of universities, Saudi Arabia too, saying this time they invade Iraq, we are joining the jihad, we are going to try and go get them. And the White House response is, oh, that's actually good. Now we've got them where we want them. We can fight them in somebody else's country instead of New York City. But with more people committing themselves to jihad, what about the lone bombers who come to other countries? like this one and mine, or what they just did in Saudi Arabia and did in Bali and did in Morocco. How do you stop that? As far as the ones coming into Iraq, Bush's response was, bring them on. <laughs> After all, he didn't have to fight them. He didn't have to sit there and get shot at and stuff. How do you think the soldiers felt when their own commander says, please come shoot at my men? 
Would he have done that if he had the faintest idea what war or combat really were? One really freaky thing that a lot of the people who started this war have in common, Bush, Cheney, Bush's brother, Wolfman, Condoleezza Rice, and I believe Blair, as well as Bill Clinton, and Sylvester Stallone, and Charles Schwarzenegger, and all kinds of other second-tier Bush people that I haven't named tonight, they're all really, really chomping at the bit for blood and war in the Middle East, but not a damn one of them has ever served in the military, let alone seen combat. This whole war is being run by chicken pox. Bush actually comes the closest because once or twice he popped in and put a uniform on and National Guard duty in Texas somewhere. And Powell does have combat experience, among other things, helping cover up the horrific My Lai massacre in Vietnam one of the worst documented atrocities committed by American soldiers against Vietnamese civilians, Rumsfeld flew fighter planes for two years in the late 50s when we weren't at war. But that's about it. And the slogan back home is, you know, support our troops. Support our troops. And anybody who criticizes Bush, no matter what he does, isn't supporting our troops. Signs in the yards. Three color red, white, and blue metal ones that cost a lot to make. Wonder who paid for them. Support our troops. Support our troops. Guess who doesn't support our troops? Bush cut their danger pay once they went to Iraq down to $150 a month. Marines now have to buy their own boots, their own socks, their own underwear, their own camouflage pay. Some of them are on food stamps. And there's an organization now called Feed the Children that throws benefits to feed hungry soldiers and their families. Meanwhile, they try to make liberating and liberating. A new Iraq sounds so easy. Now they try to make it sound hard. Even the wolf man tries to backpedal before a congressional subcommittee. Well, we're trying to, quote, get more Iraqis dying for their country so fewer Americans have to. That was a nice one. Troops are spread thin. 10% of the troops dying in Iraq now on our side are suicides. You know, way higher percentage than normal. We're running out of money. Bush has already blown $78 billion. While the Gulf War, the first one, only cost $60 billion and 80% was paid by the Allies and the Marshall Plan that rebuilt Germany and Europe after World War II and got it running again cost less than uh, $48 billion. So Bush's solution <coughs> was to propose we now spend another $87 billion, $86 billion won't do on the Iraqi war. 60 billion of it classified, I guess, but some of the things they want to spend the money on, wait till he already wants to spend it on. 240 million for roads and bridges, 150 million to recruit and train a new police force instead of just asking the old ones back. 400 million dollars, oh, more than the first two put together, on two maximum security prisons. You can build football stadiums for that amount of money. Why do you need that much money to put up a couple of jails? What are they going to do? Have an Olympic-sized swimming pool and gold faucets in every cell? Free heroin for life, too? Well, guess what the excuse is? We have to import the cement. Think about that one for a minute. What do they have in Iraq? What do you make cement out of? <laughs> Sand! You shouldn't have to spend $400 million to figure that one out unless you're as illiterate as Bush. $100 million, 
for seven American-style suburban developments with a total of 3,500 housing units in a country that has millions of homeless people, thanks to us. An Iraqi businessman already said, hey, wait a minute, I could build the same thing for 10 million. And, uh, and, and, and the, none of that even begins to add up to the 2.1 billion we want to spend having Halliburton rebuild the oil in addition to the 7 billion we already gave them, plus another 900 million to import oil products into a country sitting on the world's second largest known oil reserves. And let's not forget the $54 million computer study of Iraq's postal system. <laughs> and right last week, the Republican Congress approved it. What kind of graft is this? I reluctantly find myself agreeing that maybe we can't just pull everybody out of there and abandon the Iraqi people the way we have the people in Afghanistan, but this is insane. Even the Iraqis disagree, saying, wait a minute, why don't you just get out of here? We can fix this place better without any help from Tiny Town. You haven't really won a war until you've won the peace. And peace isn't really won so much as it's built. It's achieved. And we could start by finally giving up the authority there to the United Nations. We could start there, but... Then they counter, as soon as I do my another punk rock moment here. Mm. Ooh. Ah. <laughs> Too bad our friend is gone. <laughs> Too but, well, maybe we don't want democracy in the Middle East because those Arabs are just not ready. <laughs> They're not as civilized as we. They don't understand democracy. Well, there is one democratically elected Arab leader in the Middle East, Yasser Arafat. And there was democracy big time elsewhere in the Middle East not that long ago. But in 1953, the CIA thought it would be a dandy idea to overthrow the democratically elected leader of Iran, Mohammad Mossadegh, and replace him with the Shah, who was lividly hated by his own people for very good reason. And why did we do that? Because a uh, certain British oil company was a little upset that Mossadegh nationalized the oil. So first the British were going to do the coup and then Mossadegh caught him and threw him out. So then the British come to Harry Truman, the president after Roosevelt after World War II. He says, hell no. So then they repackage it. And when Eisenhower is president, say, well, if you don't overthrow Mossadegh, look what he did taking our oil away and demanding money for his own people. It'll go communist unless he put the Shah back in. So we put the Shah back in. And these people may have hated his guts, but we just loved him because he was going to be our new policeman in the Middle East. As the British Empire receded, the Shah would be the extension of ours. We sold him 10,000 missiles, 700 fighter planes, all kinds of artillery and torture devices for his police, needed 10,000 Americans stationed there just to maintain it all for him. And true to form, the Shah used it on his own people instead, literally killing off all moderate, non-religious opposition to his rule. Then amazingly, the Iranian people, against all those odds, overthrew the Shah anyway in the late 70s. What do we get out of that? Uh, Jimmy Carter out of the White House because of the Iranian hostage crisis and violent Islamic fundamentalist uprisings all over that part of the world and beyond because when the Iranians rose up, they had nowhere to turn to for organized leadership but violent Islamic fundamentalists led by Ayatollah Khomeini. And we were so scared of that, after all the CIA predicted this would never happen, how could this possibly go wrong? 
and Khomeini made no secret. He thought other places should be run under Islamic law and the infidels should be removed. So he began getting scared. Oh my God, what happens if the Saudi royal family goes down too? Their people hate them as much as the Shah. Same as Egypt, same as the rest. What do we do? We need a new Shah. Where are we going to find a new Shah? Where are you going to find somebody who's willing to butcher his own people and threaten everybody else just for us? Saddam, buddy, pal, want some weapons of mass destruction? Just start a war with Iran, and it doesn't matter if you kill a million people in the process, at least they'll use up all these weapons we sold the Shah, and it'll keep you too busy for a while. I can't help but wonder how much of this trouble we would be in today if we had left the Iranian people alone in the 1950s and let them elect their own leaders. And let's detour to Bush's domestic policies for a minute, too. Not even, not even Blair and my old buddy Jack Straw can come up with some of these such as uh, after a whole rash of horrible forest fires in the summer of 2002, Bush's people said, well, there's a solution to that. Cut the forests down, all of them. And they now have a law whereby if you buy one of those big, giant sport utility vehicles, you know what those are? The four-wheel drive, big, you know, the Hummer is the most obnoxious one. Auto has five Hummers. Why don't you? That's the attitude. We go to war in the Middle East so we can waste more oil on these yuppie swine mobiles. And people are encouraged to buy them, too, because now, by law, you buy one of the great big ones, like a Hummer or a Cadillac Escalade or a Lincoln Navigator or Ford Excursion, or whatever, you can write $50,000 off your taxes as a business expense. Yeah. And another scary area of Bush, of course, is that a lot of the people around him, including Cheney and John Ashcroft, the Attorney General, are hardcore Bible-thumping fundamentalist Christians. And as the Commerce Secretary, Donald Evans, put it, God called on the president to wage war in Iraq, and that made it a wise decision. <laughs> Unfortunately, Bush believes this stuff too. Just like bin Laden, he thinks he's taking his orders from God. What happens if somebody plants it in his pea brain that God wants him to bring Jesus back so he can take him for a ride on Gator or whatever. <laughs> and hey, George, we know you don't ever read that Bible you love so much because you can't, but <laughs> remember Armageddon. If Jesus is not going to come back until there's Armageddon. And for the, until there's a rapture. And for that, you need Armageddon, George. You're getting closer, George, but you've got to speed it up. Come on, Sharon's doing his part. Push those buttons. Launch those weapons of mass destruction. We want Armageddon so Jesus will come back. And just think, George, in heaven, you can be commissioner of baseball. <laughs> So-called affirmative action laws designed to get people from racial minorities and poor class backgrounds, give them a leg up so they can get into good schools and get better jobs, that all has to go, too. And as Bush puts it, everybody should get his position on the basis of merit. So why is he president? <laughs> Call off our war on drugs, ethnic cleansing American style that feeds the prison industrial complex. We have private prisons too. In order for the companies to grow, you have to put more people in jail and enact nastier drug laws and longer sentencing laws. But anyway, we have now that means we have a higher percentage of our people in jail than any other country in the history of the world. Do something about this? Oh, no. Now they're running ads on television claiming that if you smoke weed, you're aiding terrorists. <laughs> Smoking pot means you're down with bin Laden and Al-Qaeda and all. What kind of drugs were they on when they came up with that one? 
Not to mention when Bush also proposed at that State of the Union address last January, spending $600 million on a three-year program to cure our drug addiction problems with prayer. <laughs> And then he appointed this guy to one of the health advisory committees at the Food and Drug Administration who'd written a book or co-written a book called Stress on the Woman's Body where he suggested one way that might cure headaches, pre-MS, you know, premenstrual syndrome, skin disorders, and even some cancer. Well, all you need is prayer. And he's trying to put on one of the high federal courts, one lower than the Supreme Court, the Attorney General of Alabama, William Pryor, who is currently on a crusade to outlaw vibrators. <laughs> and for our broadcast industry, he's come up with uh, Michael Powell, who's called our broadcast industry under-monopolized, and says he has no idea what the public interest is. How did he get the job? He's Colin Powell's son. Imagine a fat baby Doc Duvalier version of Colin Powell. That's Michael Powell. Oh, and you'll love this one. As you probably know, America is the land where everything that they can privatize is privatized, which is why a lot of it works so badly. You think your trains got fucked up after Thatcher and Blair decided they should be privatized. Well, our trains have practically disappeared. Los Angeles had a tram system, a train system, in the first half of the 20th century, then somebody got the bright idea to privatize it and turned it over to a consortium consisting of General Motors, Phillips Petroleum, and Firestone Tires. In no time like magic, a perfectly good tram company was bankrupt, and they tore up the tracks and got rid of them before anybody realized what was going on. One more reason privatization doesn't work. Oh, where, oh, did I put it back downstairs? I think I did. The amazing Kim Howells quote justifying the Potter's Bar train wreck saying people just have to get used to the fact that accidents happen. <laughs> Privatization, once again, rail track, now that it's privatized, they're supposed to be inspecting and replacing the tracks and have kind of forgotten to do that because they've been using the money to uh, pay out bigger executive bonuses. <laughs> That is privatization, but the thing you really should resist as vehemently as you resisted the poll tax and all is all efforts to privatize health care systems. Somebody as corrupt and obsessed as Blair and his crew could think that it's possibly a better idea to have the whole healthcare system run in order to profit off of people's misery. The disease industry, and that means that hardly anybody can go in and get health care without either paying huge bills or paying huge monthly bills to corporate private insurance companies who then have gatekeeper doctors, who you have to see first, who look for any excuse to say there's nothing wrong with you, doesn't matter if there's a big old malignant tumor growing this far out of your body, no, 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 it's all in your mind. No, no, it's just a scratch, whatever. Anything that keep you from seeing a specialist, but then if you do have some, turn up with something like HIV or cancer or need heart surgery, they can yank your insurance card and say, oh, we can't make any more money off of you. Why don't you just die? In San Francisco, when some of the corporations took over some of the hospitals there, one by one, they started shutting down the emergency rooms because they didn't make enough money. One of many pitfalls of privatized health care. But they finally, going the other direction a little bit in the Bush world, a fetus now has federal health insurance. The fetus is insured, the mother is not. This is what the, you know, this is their pandering to extreme right-wing Christians and all in what they call family values. This is all about the family. Schwarzenegger's all family values too. Well, 
As far as I'm concerned, the family values people, what really weirds me out about them is they're all about the life of the unborn child is sacred. But once they're born, fuck them. <laughs> born any welfare payments so the mother can stay home and nurse the child no any head start programs and any, any nutrition programs or anything money for the schools hell no but we'll gladly build you a jail cell for later <laughs> on and we write to life fetus lovers we love the death penalty too and we'll even sentence you to death when you're 16 years old that's our family values american style in the bush case it means getting rid of the center for disease control National Center for Disease Control Sex Education Program, because it mentioned contraception and AIDS prevention. And instead, they want to spend another half billion dollars on a new program in school about sex, abstinence only. <laughs> if everybody just ignores all that bad sex stuff until they're married and gonna make more lovely Christians by then, everything will be wonderful. Granted, we gotta do something about the massive teenage pregnancy rate in our country, much higher than any other industrialized country, maybe because uh, the fundamentalists keep vetoing sex education programs. But they can at least say, well, if you want to, if you really want everybody to abstain, you can at least have masturbation. <laughs> they shouldn't take people like me to until they're 40 years old to figure out that at an age when you never know what kind of diseases a new partner may have, that mutual masturbation doesn't automatically make you a bad lover. They could be teaching that in school instead. Clinton Surgeon General suggested that and he fired her two days later. Abstinence only. And held up as an example of what they have in mind is the National Abstinence Clearinghouse of Sioux Falls, South Dakota which teaches people about the evils of sex, people 16, 17, 18, by having them cut out paper hearts out of construction paper, put them on their chest, and pledge not to ever get into any of that fornication or sin. <laughs> Unto the instructor and her learning aids, consisting of a collection of rubber snakes. <laughs> Rubber snakes with big long fangs with names like Herbie Herpy, Hester Hepatitis, Albert Ames, Poor Pregnant Peggy Sue, and Lucy Loss of Reputation. <laughs> So how do we avoid being dragged any further down the road to ruin and off a cliff by a bush, a dick, and a colon? <laughs> I stole that from Al Jorgensen, but it was so good I had to. For those of you who read in the British press, there's a new Lard album coming out. Who never announced it to me? I mean, if we record it first, there will be a new Lard album, but there is that obstacle. But stay tuned. Meanwhile, keep an eye out for my album with the Melvins, which will hopefully be coming. Anyway, but meanwhile, with the blowing all this money in the war and cutting all these taxes, mainly for the richest 1% of the population, Bush has indeed driven our economy totally down the toilet and the bottom cannot yet be seen. Here's how you can help. Don't believe the hype. We are patriotic citizens too. Our drunk friend somehow hinted that it was bad for me to criticize my own country, but somebody has the care enough to do it. Bush sure doesn't. 
Patriotism is about love of country and the people in it and the environment and all. Extending that to how we treat other people's countries and the land they live in. Patriotism is not giving blind loyalty and a blank check to Bush and to Blair. They really are to justify and keep selling their goddamn pissy war. They're desperate because they know people aren't buying it. And they know those protests were the biggest in history, and which I think did have a dampering effect on what could have been even worse. And sure, they're smaller now, but I have a feeling with the end of the Hutton Choir and everything, maybe we'll see some critical mass in the streets again. And keep this in mind, if Blair goes down, Bush is going too. Not even Arnold Mania is going to be able to keep that one down. And uh, leaders in the other countries who've stood at least pretty firm so far should be encouraged to do so. If you know people in Germany and France and some of the other countries, email them and tell them, yeah, hit the streets again to send the message that they should not bend in this any further than they already have. You know, one more thing you can do to help save the world from my country and its lovely government. And I know it kind of feels lonely right now because the war did go on anyway and there's no real end in sight or easy solution. Everybody's saying, well, everybody supports the war now. Well, that's the same situation few lonely voices in the wilderness faced Back in 1964, earlier, the ones who saw the writing on the wall said, yo, we should not be getting involved in Vietnam. This is going to be a disaster. It'll blow up in our face. It's wrong. We shouldn't be there. And they were put down as traitors, communists, peaceniks, freaks, pinkos, faggots. <laughs> But in the long run, against incredible odds, with a whole military-industrial complex aiming at the people with both barrels, and the hierarchies of the Democratic and Republican parties aiming at the people with both barrels, the people with a lot of help from your country and others rose up and we did stop the Vietnam War. We've done it once, we can do it again. Look how quickly we shut down Daddy Bush's Gulf War. I don't think he intended for it to uh, only last a little over a month, but the protests got awful damn fierce, awful damn fast, and uh, something drastic had to be done. Of course, unfortunately, one key difference from Vietnam is you don't see the bloody war footage on television anymore. It's a happy war, you know, happy news for happy people with happy problems. And a lot of you know, the media, even here, is much more censored, I suspect, than it was before, and really is in the belly of the beast. But don't hate the media, become the media. Not just supporting, if not participating in, all the independent and underground zines and all, but trading information, getting it out on the net to people you know, making up a little list, but try to get, make sure the information is at least good before you send it out on the net instead of being like these people who uh, lit up the dead Kennedy and Jello Biafra chat rooms like Christmas trees a few years ago. Gruesome detail after gruesome detail of my shooting death. <laughs> and I, this went on day after day after day, and I looked in the shower, I couldn't find the bullet holes, I couldn't find the blood, but the internet said I was dead, so it must be true, right? Well, wrong. Be careful with that. But uh, one really important part of becoming the media, especially now, is going one-on-one -on -one to people you know at home, school, work, 
family, and if they start spouting pro-war bullshit or racist anti-immigrant bullshit or uh, wouldn't it be great if we privatized more things bullshit, although very few civilians like the idea, you know, especially the anti-immigrant stuff, because that's starting to get pretty odious over here, just like on the European continent. Don't just tune people out as unreachable or dismiss them as being stupid. Talk to them. Sit down and talk to them. If it's somebody you know, you have that much more of a chance of knowing what's really important to them and getting in and uh, inside their heads and at least planting some seeds that might change a mind later if we don't who will, after all. And if they are saying, well, we have to fight this war on terrorism, well, even that can be countered with, yo, the way we're fighting the war on terrorism is piss poor military strategy. <laughs> I mean, how are we going to eradicate terrorism and the sentiments behind it when every time we blow thousands of people up and kill them in the Middle East, not to mention occupy their land, all we're doing is planting the seeds for more Osama bin Ladens, more Al-Qaeda's, more suicide bombers. <laughs> making our own countries and our own lives less and less and less safe. That is not good military strategy. Support our troops? Yeah, I support our troops. I say bring them home. Get them out of there. And another thing you could do, if you know people in the United States, you could email them from time to time, just tell them how things are over here, how things work, everything from the health system to no people really do hate your president that bad over here. This is how people do a little bit more detail than that. <laughs> I mean, there's mountains of Encyclopedia Britannica-sized volumes you could write on all the reasons to fuck George Bush. <laughs> but you got to get out to people. Keep in mind, Americans learn so little about other countries in our school system, they probably couldn't find it Scotland on a map. Yeah, oh, they was that attached to England. It's like right next to New York, right? City in like Massachusetts. But educate people, and I mean, most Americans have no idea that other countries don't have the death penalty. No clue. Clue them in. You never know how that could help change a few things here and there. And the approach to the war on terrorism could be a little more oriented toward prevention and protection rather than punishment, such as not only ending our dependence on foreign oil, but as much as humanly possible, working to end our dependence on oil altogether. As far as I'm concerned, there ought to be a law that anybody who owns one of those sport utility vehicle yuppie swine mobiles is automatically in the military reserve. The ones who get called up when we need troops to invade a place like Iraq, sure, go get your own goddamn oil. And Instead of blowing money on terror wars and Iraq wars and Star Wars, we want to prevent another September 11th. We can do a lot more in the area of safer airports and safer airplanes. Bush even uh, opposed upgrading the workforce who inspected the carry-on bags at airports because it would take profits away from rent-a-cop companies. And in the case of San Francisco, the rent-a-cop company paid the people checking the carry-on bags the lowest wage of anybody in the whole airport. So turnover was very high at that job. There's some lessons to be learned from El Al Airlines in Israel as well on these. Um, for example, they, I mean, they haven't had a hijacking since, what, the late 60s? And they protect their pilots through not one but two bulletproof doors. 
and they reinforce the floor of the cabin to the plane so that even if somebody does get on there and tries to write a new chapter of The Last Temptation of Reed and blow their shoe up or something, it won't necessarily down the aircraft. Plus, on every flight, they have a plane clothes commando trained specifically in breaking up hijackings. And I, you know, as much as I don't like having more police in the world, I'd much rather have trained air marshals on every flight who could stop a hijacking than die. Thank you very much. <laughs> a much better use of our military skill than wasting it and destroying other people's countries, and a far better solution than what we're now doing in America, arming the pilots. And even some of the flight attendants. Picture the possibilities. Would you like a snack? Bam! Oh dear, I'll get a towel. <laughs> and another thing we could just be, it would help national security and all, is they would take some of that Defense Department budget away and build a proper train system. Especially a high-speed train system that probably cost a fraction of one B-2 stealth bomber or whatever. And then, instead of having to wait in line at the airport and put up with all this crap and spew jet fuel smog into the air, you just go and get on the train. And if it's a bullet train, SF to San Francisco to Los Angeles in an hour or, or two hours or something. Go cross country that way, and you can get up and walk around on the train, you can get drunk on the train, <laughs> and, you know, and what do you get out the window instead of the same old cloud? Scenery! <laughs> but even though it may blow by at warp speed, that shouldn't bother the MTV generation at all. <laughs> and, uh, sure, you can hijack a train, but you can't fly it into buildings and kill thousands of innocent people. Besides, trains are cool. <laughs> and they're now saying, oh my god, Al Qaeda's going to blow up our nuclear power plants now. Not if we shut them down. <laughs> And another one of Osama bin Laden's key demands is not as lunatic as bin Laden himself, namely the, the Israel situation. I do not oppose Israel's right to exist and have nothing against the Israeli people, but their government is insane. <laughs> that if we all pulled our ambassadors and cut off all military aid to Israel, Sharon would rejoin civilization in a matter of minutes. Uh. And another thing we could be doing is we never did disarm all the Mujahideen guerrillas in Afghanistan who then went back to their warlording ways yet again we could at least be going on the borderland where they sell the leftover weapons, including the, some of the 200 missing rocket launchers we gave the Mujahideen way back when. And then, all those leftover weapons there, but then there's bigger ones, even up to mass destruction ones, just sitting there, either waiting to be stolen, sold, or rot and explode, in the former Soviet Union, all those Central Asian countries now, there's rumored to be leftover nuclear stuff in Kazakhstan and the Ukraine as well as Russia. And just like Afghanistan, after the Cold War, we did dickle for the people in the former Soviet Union. Now you can see what capitalism's really like and starve and freeze and let mobsters rip you off. Well, Sooner or later, if we let that continue, those people are going to get desperate enough that they're going to start selling those weapons to anybody who will give them something to eat. When we could spend the military and the Star Wars money going into those countries and buying up those weapons on site and destroying them on site so nobody else can use them anymore. which we could then extend to a campaign to disarm the entire world. Instead of being caught in this 
horse race of America versus Britain versus France versus Russia versus China and yes, Israel to see who can sell the most weapons to the most dictators and heads of state and to the people opposing them and when they start shooting each other, sell them some more. <laughs> Look what we've done to Africa. Look what we've done to Africa. And on top of that, yes, we do need a full-on Marshall Plan, not just for Iraq and not run by Texas businessmen, but also for Afghanistan, which is now, just like the last time, the Taliban are back, the guerrillas are back, the opium is back, as I said before. Don't we ever learn? I mean, you'd think we would have learned something, because after World War I, we did nothing for the German people but rub their noses in the ruins and humiliation of what was left of their country. And for a while, it was so bad in Germany after World War I that it took a wheelbarrow full of money to buy a loaf of bread. By the early 1930s, things hadn't gotten that much better, and people were so bitter and so desperate they all but democratically elected Hitler. <laughs> then look what happened. At least after that, we were a little smarter. We did have the Marshall Plan to rebuild the infrastructure of Europe, and we stuck around and rebuilt Japan and introduced some semblance of democracy there where there hadn't been any in their entire history. Voila. No Hitlers, not even a Bin Laden. So why no Marshall Plan for the former Soviet Union? An, ast <laughs> an astronomical job, an expensive job, but no more expensive than all the money we waste on military warship we're never ever going to use year after year after year. And to quote Michael Moore, will we ever get to the point where we realize that the world will, that, that we will be more secure when the rest of the world isn't living in poverty so we can have nice running shoes? <laughs> Another concept that intrigues me is, um, Bush has already, in two years, run the American economy $458 billion in the hole. <coughs> Federal budget deficit, dwarfing anything Reagan did before. More to come. We haven't even started paying for the wars yet. How do we run our country if we don't have any money? We borrow money by selling bonds. To individual citizens, you buy a five-year, a 10-year, 15-year bond, it matures, you get more money back, supposedly. And American bonds have done very well over the years, considered one of the world's safest investments, which means overseas corporations and governments with pension funds and universities with funds and all kinds of things, unions even, put a lot of money into American bonds. $550 billion a year into American bonds comes from overseas investors. This was how the white racist apartheid regime in South Africa sustained themselves too, because they had all that gold and everything. People invested in it. And when people over here decided, okay, the white apartheid people are so well armed, we gotta find some other way to bring them down from outside the country, Who's funding them? Shell Oil, boycott, Bank of America, pickets and protests. Many a university turned out to have money in South Africa and were forced to divest. Many city governments did too. And in the long run, so many people pulled out that the white apartheid regime collapsed because they were broke, among other things. So what would happen if people began shining a light and looking under rocks to see who around here who can actually be poked with a fork has got money in American bonds and therefore are helping pay for Bush's war? So if they start pulling some of that money out, Bush is going to have a much harder time at all. And I'm hoping that this whole anti-war movement that had the largest demonstrations in the history of the world will also extend to helping grow the numbers, hopefully to that size, of people resisting this ongoing coup 
of turning our sovereignty and our democracy over to global corporations. Power and globalization have gone too damn far. I think most of us would agree. But luckily, in return, there's a giant worldwide anti-corporate movement already there. I guess the, 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 the uh, some people call it the spirit of Seattle, even though to me, when I was there, it seemed like, oh, we're finally being like the Europeans or the people when they didn't like the poll tax. And, getting off our butts and <laughs> doing something about it finally. But this movement extends into Brazil, into India, and many other countries, big and small. But there's things we can also do as individuals without having to join any organization, risk getting our head cracked, or giving up most of our life uh, as well. You know, it doesn't have to, don't let the farty old left convince you that fighting against the war and the even bigger long-term menace of corporate power should be restricted to a grim struggle of the proletariat against the big, bad, fascist Pigs. And you know what yeah. we're gonna do? We're gonna have meetings, god damn it. <laughs> you know, I, fighting, all you have to do to start fighting corporate power, don't let the more radical than thou ever convince you that just because you may not be doing as much as they are or the same things that they are, that you're useless. Doing something is better than doing nothing. Every <laughs> If you want to, just making a little vow to yourself, should you decide to do this, I'm not cooperating with corporations and their agenda anymore. Yeah! Starting with, don't give them your money anymore. No more money to corporate chain stores. No more money to corporate chain restaurants. And keep your money with the local businesses who keep it in the community instead. <laughs> Think of the benefits. The independent local music store instead of the Virgin Mega Store. Better music. Store instead of the Borders mega chain or whatever, the clerk may even know how to read. <laughs> the local market instead of the big old corporate supermarket, theft way, hypermarket, or whatever, and you better you have a better chance of getting locally grown food, hopefully organic food, instead of genetically modified, or should I say genetically mutilated, Franken food. <laughs> your cornflakes in your grocery bag and in your mouth without anything on the box telling you what it really is. And, uh, and as hard as it is long term to find meaningful work that will actually pay the bills so you don't wind up my age still living in a rat hole with uh, roommates you can't stand, <laughs> try not to work for them. <laughs> Don't give them your time, your energy, your intelligence. But if you must work for them, just remember the digital age has brought us a whole new frontier of sabotage on the job. <laughs> wind up in a lucrative career at some point, doctor, lawyer, dentist, construction person, uh, uh, website genius, whatever, one way of giving back to the community is giving back to the community. <laughs> Providing the service you make so much money from to somebody who can't afford it for free every once in a while. The lawyer who represented me on the Dead Kennedys Frankenchrist album Obscenity Bus did it for no fee. Because he said he wanted to give something back to his profession and uh, he was sick of people like Reagan and Tipper Gore trying to tear our Constitution into little pieces. I wasn't so lucky with an Ed Kennedy's ordeal, unfortunately, but uh, 
you know, that is an example of giving back to the community. None of those guys helped with that case, by the way, either. But anyway, giving back to the community, also, it's not only good for the soul, but it falls under the greater umbrella of not forgetting who you are or where you came from long term. Not just, not just five days or five months from now, but five years from now, 10, 15. Don't forget what brings you to events like this and why you feel about certain things the way you do. Don't turn into the former members of my old band. Don't turn into Tony Blair. Don't turn into the wolf man who apparently was against the Vietnam War way back when, and then now he started a worse one and thinks he's cool. Don't let this happen to you or more closer to home. Perhaps some of you have encountered a parent or two in your life who does things like, oh yeah, your mom and I, we had a great time when we were your age. Smoke the weed, get it on in the park, cause trouble in the street. But now that you're that age, just say no. But take your ribbon, take your Prozac, the best way to not let that happen to you is to not let it happen to you. Same with this line. It happens to a lot of people when they cross a line without realizing it. When It happens when people buy a home and or have children. And all of a sudden there's something very, very precious and very, very important that they really, really want to protect for good reason. But it also means that a very worldly person's world can get real small. It's all about, I'm only interested in protecting me and my family. I want a bigger wall around my house and a wall around the neighborhood and maybe even some private police and maybe even somebody to occupy city hall and parliament who will make sure no brown people move in and drive down my property values. And I need an SUV flying mobile armored car, luxury armored car, to take my precious artifact child to school, to soccer to the uh, psychiatrist or whatever. <laughs> and uh, above hey, all, oh, oh, no matter oh, how bad the community needs it, I don't want anybody raising my taxes. <laughs> you raise my taxes, we're going to make a movie star governor. Oh, like, uh, that money's for me. And I don't think any of my money should go to benefit anybody else, because it's my money. Don't fall into that. It doesn't have to be that way. And another cool thing about the, what they call the spirit of Seattle, in my mind, is not only people looking at how depressing the big picture is, but still be willing to break off chunks of the puzzle and fight smaller, winnable, local battles, which is what makes voting in local elections so important, too. But also, this whole worldwide anti-corporate movement, where's the great big magic leaders? Where are the ones who are going to save us? Tonight. There ain't no, there ain't no Nelson O'Connor. No, 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 no. That's not what I'm trying to put across here. I'm not trying to, like, I don't know. I'm not uh, concerned. <laughs> anyway. Couldn't have Anyway. Um, there ain't no Nelson Mandela, Vashlav, Havel, Soup Commandante, Ski Mask, riding in on a white horse to lead everybody to the promised land. Even though there's some people are better known or better organized than others, by and large, we are stitching this together and leading ourselves. And that's cool. But beyond that, then what? The reason I say this is because corporations are getting so scared away with screwing the least advantaged people on earth and screwing the rest of us too, they even want to privatize water now and jack up the rates. And Monsanto going into India and picking a strand of rice, going to the WTO, patenting it, then going back to the people who've grown it for thousands of years saying, where's our royalty? How long is this going to go on before corporations have a train wreck? 
And I think there will be a train wreck, not right away, but in our lifetime. Then what happens? Well, look back to the late 80s, early 90s, when all these revolutions happened, and most of them happened unexpectedly, suddenly. Nobody expected the Berlin Wall to go down when it did, and all of a sudden, down it went. Down went the brutal communist regime of Czechoslovakia and so many more. Down went the white apartheid regime in South Africa as soon as Bush won and James Baker were out of there and whatnot. Um, unexpected, again, relative lack of bloodshed, but not every place has been so lucky like the Balkan countries, not just the former Yugoslavia, but Romania is real fun right now, too, for example. And Russia ain't much better, and, but they're a lot better off than Rwanda or the Congo or someplace like that. But there are inspiring examples of how to do these things relatively right. And even though these places aren't perfect today, I still think the revolution in South Africa and the Velvet Revolution in the former Czechoslovakia are still, to me, very inspiring because it seems like when the train wreck happened and nobody expected it, at least the hardcore frontline radical opposition not only knew what they were fighting against, they had given some thought into what they were fighting for and they knew what they wanted in addition to what they didn't want to the point where they, you know, they were, got a little more ready and had kind of knew who might be best qualified to help run different parts of the apparatus so the whole country didn't fall apart. Are we there yet? Yeah, I'm not sure we're there yet either. But one way to help get there as an individual, it sounds like an ego trip, but it's really not, to put yourself in the place of the people who are pulling the levers and running things and figure out what you'd do instead. What would I do if I was in Blair's shoes about this particular issue right now? What would I do if I was mayor of Glasgow? What would I do if I was in charge of cleaning up the police department? What would I do if I was in charge of the school system? What would, I, I know the police. <laughs> what would I do if I was in place of the boss I hate so much at work? How would I run the place differently and make it work? Well, this is why I'm asking you to like get ready with them. I mean, if we don't do this and just wait for uh, other people to do the work and come in and ride on their white horse and lead us to wherever, and then, at least where I come from, everybody with that attitude who has a truck and a gun will be going around playing king of the neighborhood. And basically, if we do just sit on our ass and don't start getting ourselves ready, well, I mean, doing this, you can put it on the shelf, do it some more, do put it on the shelf, do it some more, et cetera, but it can't help but make you smarter, hint, hint, and, and start figuring out what you're good at and what you know and can bring to the table that the rest of us are going to need if we all need to depend on each other to keep this thing from falling apart and finally running it right. Because if we wait for everybody else to come in and do the work and aren't ready, we will get fooled again. Thanks for coming.